afternoon. I'd wel I welcome you. Please make your way in if you're out in the hallway. We're going to try to find our seats and get started. I want to welcome you to our 2024 Spring Theology Conference. It's, uh, it's always a delight to see so many uh, old friends and new friends here at this conference. And, and I think it's a special delight for all of us at the seminary because of the topic this year, modern missions in the reformed world. What a glorious thing for us to turn our attention to for these next few days. And we're looking forward to uh, viewing this uh, idea of modern missions, this, this, this uh, important task that we're given uh, from a variety of perspectives. Um, by way of announcements and kind of housekeeping, I think everything you're going to need to know is in these programs that you picked up when you registered. There's a map in there. There's a very detailed schedule. And if you have any questions, of course, you are more than welcome to ask any of us. But I think all the details uh, should be uh, made clear in there. We'll have some other announcements related to special things um, as the as the sessions move on, but I think for now I would just turn your attention to this. Uh, in, in this program, what you'll notice is each of the sessions has a page for taking notes and also has uh, hymns uh, right next to these pages. So you won't need to use the hymnals that are in the pews, and you can use uh, this program. So uh, you'll see under session one, there's one hymn on the facing page and then another hymn on the page behind it. So you'll need to keep your programs out for the singing portion of it. Now, I want to also say a few words about our first session and our first speaker before we stand and sing. Chad Vegas has become a very good friend, a, a good personal friend of mine, but also a friend of the seminary, and he's had an increasing uh, role with us, and that's going to be increasing even more in future years, Lord willing. But uh, Chad is the pastor of Sovereign Grace Church in Bakersfield, California, a church which he planted, and he also is the co-founder of Radius International. Radius has a booth out there. If you've not heard of Radius, uh, there's more information available there. We gave Chad a very difficult task. We asked him to begin the conference by assessing what's going on in modern missions today. And largely, that assessment is going to have some critical features to it. And we knew that. And we asked him to, to be honest about what he's seeing. And so we're starting off by, as it were, looking at some of the challenges, some of the problems, some of the things that we need to be aware of. And then we're going to address in uh, the sessions, the subsequent sessions, what it is that the Bible says about these things and what it is that we can learn from the best examples of our past. So uh, it, is, it is a real delight and a privilege to, to welcome Chad and to host him this week. I know you'll benefit greatly uh, from what he has to say in his address. Now, I mentioned earlier that the hymns are in here, and so I would ask you to turn in your program to the hymn that's on the facing page from session one, Holy God, we praise your name. And let's stand together, if you're able, and sing this great hymn of the faith.
pray together. Our great God and heavenly Father, we bow before you. We bless your name. You are our creator. All that we have comes from you. In you we live and move and have our being. Father, not only are you our creator, not only is it to you that we owe our very existence, but you are our redeemer. Oh, we thank you for the redemption that you've given us in and through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the sending of your spirit and for his work in our midst. And we would ask that your Holy Spirit would work in a powerful way during this session and all the sessions to come. We commit our time to you. We pray that you would encourage us, that you would instruct us, that you would convict us where necessary. We pray that the great work of carrying forth the good news of Jesus Christ would be presented before us with clarity by your spirit. We ask that you would be with our speaker. We pray that you might give him great liberty and clarity and power. And Father, in all of this, in everything we do, we ask that you might see fit to glorify your son in our midst. And it is in Jesus' name that we ask these things. Amen. Good afternoon. It's a, a privilege to be here with you. Um, in so many ways, I'm thankful for this opportunity. If you will, um, as I'm up here, turn with me to Matthew 28. While I won't be really doing an expositional sermon today, I do want to begin with the reading of this text, which was much spoken of this morning at the pre-conference. If you didn't hear that, um, I encourage you to get the audio from the Reform Forum on that, but um, we'll be much spoken of the rest of the week that we're here, I'm sure. So let's begin with reading that. Matthew 28, verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, we ask that your spirit would be at work among us as we think about this commission that Christ has given to his church and to some degree the mess that we've made of it in recent years, the ways in which we are called to be faithful to it. We pray that you would help us to hear your word, to receive it with joy, to be repentant where we need to be repentant, to give thanks where we need to give thanks, and above all, that we would really bask in, enjoy the love of Christ shown to us, and the privilege of making him known to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. I, I tend to get loud, and this mic is a little hot, just as a kind of warning for you. Um, the, I'm not entirely sure what the graphic that we've put up means for the conference, except I think that ship is the Evangelical Church in Missions, just about to hit that rock. So um, I've been, I think that's what Pat's alluding to, but I'm not sure. When he asked me to do this session, I, I was happy to do it. I felt a little bit bad to begin um, by sort of laying out the problems in modern missions uh, because I'm, I don't have a discernment blog. I'm not that guy who's typically out there crit criticizing everything, but um, 
I have ended up in this role to some degree, and I, I, I sort of want to begin by addressing how I've ended up in this role. Uh, by God's grace, we planted our church, Sovereign Grace, in 2006 uh, with a group of seven people. Um, we began speaking in the early days of the church about people groups, and, and you'll hear me use the language of, or, or the words language groups, and what I mean by that, because when we say people groups, what do we even mean, right? Um, or the, or the left-handed bikers of South Carolina, a people group, right? And because people group just has become so flexible, it's almost not meaningful any longer. So what I mean when I say people group is an ethno-linguistically distinct group of people, a people who've never heard the gospel. They don't have the word of God in their language. They don't have a church in their language. They don't have a Bible in their language. They've, they've never, they don't have a Christian witness in their language. That's who I'm speaking to. We spoke about these language groups at the beginning of our church plant, uh, these groups who had never heard the name of, of Christ. And it was our desire to really be a church that raised up and sent missionaries to these unreached language groups. We really wanted to do that. Our church knew that there were about, according to the people group studies that have been done, about 3,100 such groups in our world who had never heard of Jesus Christ. Those people, 3,100 distinct languages that have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. There is no Christian missionary there. There is no church there. There is no Bible for them. But we had no idea how to train people for that work or where to train people for that work. We knew what Bible colleges and seminaries were and that we ought to send people for the biblical and theological training they needed, but where do candidates learn linguistics and phonemics and phonetics and creating a written orthography because many of these secondary, if you will, uh, language groups don't have a written language. Teaching literacy to them, doing Bible translation, cross-cultural church planning, how to access a closed country, transitioning a church to indigenous leadership, considerations regarding culture and worldview, international business, how to watch out for their personal and family safety, how to uh, establish their identity and sort of bury themselves on the internet, the footprint that they have digitally, so they're not found out. How do you do all that? Well, the Lord brought together a group of us to start Radius International to train people in those regards. The Lord also worked kindly at our church. Uh, we have been privileged to send out numerous people from within our, own, within our own body to the missionary work I'm speaking of here. And we have more people who are potential candidates or candidates for us right now in the, in the pipeline. And you might say, well, you must have been a big old church when you did all this. No, there were, there were a hundred of us and I mean, when I say a hundred of us, I'm, I'm counting sort of like a Baptist counts, right? There's 65 in the room, hundred people came today. And right, so okay, so we, we were, there were a hundred of us. And we started this um, organization that's now trained. Uh, we're running toward after this year, over 400 missionaries. Um, with that said, the more our own church sent out missionaries and worked with what are um, often called sending agencies, you guys have heard this language, the church is the sending agency, but, but we, we have these kind of sending agencies out there. The more we worked with them, the more we were appalled at what was happening in evangelical mission efforts. Even among organizations many of us consider trustworthy. The more I saw this, the more I felt the need to address it. And I addressed one of the areas of concern in an article. Uh, it's on something called Disciple Making Movements, which I'll address in a, in a moment. But I addressed that article concern in, a, in an article that sort of went viral in the evangelical missions world. Um, and before I knew it, I was asked to, to debate on that topic. Um, and that debate ended up being videoed and going even further than the article. And the next thing I knew, I was being asked often to come speak about the problems in modern missions, and so here I am. <laughs> That's how these things work. I'm a pastor. I help train missionaries. I'm not a, a, a discernment blogger about problems in modern missions, but I'm going to address them anyway. So I want to address problems in modern missions under two headings. First um, heading is the low-hanging fruit. These are going to be really simple headings. You don't have to write them down. The low-hanging fruit of evangelical errors and missions. 
The second is, I'll just call the high, higher hanging fruit. Isn't that easy? The higher hanging fruit of reformed errors and missions. As we go along, I hope to bring to bear how the Bible addresses these errors um, to the degree that I can in, in the course of one session. But we're gonna focus largely on the contemporary problems in this session, and then a lot of the other sessions, I'm sure we'll be working out a more aspirational, inspirational way of going forward. But let's start with our first point, the low-hanging fruit of evangelical errors. So what are the evangelical errors and missions that I'm speaking to? Look with me at Matthew 28 again, and we'll just jump right to verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, the evangelical world hears this text and feels a sense of urgency. They want to obey. They want to make disciples in all nations. And that is admirable, the urgency that I often see among our evangelical brothers and sisters. But their urgency, that sense of urgency, is often, often overrun by doctrinal errors in a number of regards. Let me provide you with these errors in five categories. Um, so first, an errant understanding of the gospel. That's the first error, an errant understanding of the gospel. Now, now there, there are a number of examples of these. I'll, I'll give you a few. One uh, which parades around in, in missiological circles um, called the Missio Dei, the mission of God. Um, the Missio, Missio Dei or the mission of God, what's God's mission in the world, is often in mission circles not grounded in the mission of the Son and the mission of the Holy Spirit. Rather, it's grounded in some broader notion of God's mission, divorced from the sending of His Son to be the incarnate Christ, and the sending of a spirit to apply the work of the Christ to us. And so the Great Commission can be fulfilled by an unbeliever. Did you know that? It can be fulfilled by an unbeliever through social justice or environmental justice initiatives. I, I, there are actually organizations that talk about the Great Commission and the fulfillment of environmental justice. The great commandment to love God and our neighbor becomes the work of the Great Commission. So I dig a well in Africa, I'm fulfilling the Great Commission. No, you're not. You're loving your neighbor. That's good. It's godly. You should do that. But you haven't preached the gospel and made disciples. The, the labeling of, here's another error under the misunderstanding of the gospel, labeling, labeling of penal substitution as a Western gospel. Penal substitution is a Western gospel. The teaching here is that we bring a gospel that deals uh, with honor and shame to Eastern contexts. We bring a gospel that deals with power and fear to animus contexts. The idea of guilt and atonement is a uniquely Western notion not found in the ancient Near East. Never mind Leviticus. This is pushed by Jackson Wu, who's recently changed back to his... Um, his original given name, he's a white guy in Kentucky who called himself Jackson Wu as he wrote articles about the East. A guy named Jason Georges um, has a book on this. Um, their work largely builds on the work of N.T. Wright. Now, now, we don't need to get rid of the Western Gospels, what they're going to tell you. Keep the Western Gospel. It's really helpful for guilt-laden Westerners. But it's not the Gospel. And to push it on everyone else is ineffectual and imperialistic, right? Imperialism is the kind of things that Scottish men like Ian like to participate in, but we shouldn't do it in missions. The gospel of obedience-based discipleship is another one. So um, that we hear obedience-based discipleship is a big phrase in the modern missions movement. Jesus told us that we're to teach people to obey. Therefore, um, as we teach them to obey in small ways, small ways, so get together a group of unbelievers, we show them the Bible text, they say there's something here for you to obey. And as they obey in small ways, 
little ways. Slowly, they begin to obey more and more. And as they begin to obey more and more, they begin to turn toward Christ until they have reached full submission to Christ via obedience. And now they're converts. Now, that idea found its genesis in the IMB, International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. A missiologist by the last name of Watson, if you will, climbed the dung heap of history and pulled out the idol of Pelagius and cleaned it off and bowed down to it and taught the rest of the missions world to do the same. Second area of, of error is an errant understanding of the church. An errant understanding of the church. So an errant understanding of the gospel, an errant understanding of the church. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but one of the things that, that we've tended to do over the years at Radius, and you may not have ever heard the story because you don't know much about Radius, but one of the things we've tended to do over the years is ask the incoming students two questions. What is the gospel and what is the church? And they are incredibly unclear on both. Seminary grads, doesn't matter. They're unclear on both the gospel and the church. So it's, it's easy to begin to give them missions methodologies that confuse them, take them down bad paths. This Aaron understanding of the church uh, was uh, really showed up largely a couple decades ago with the thing called insider movements, um, was big then. It's still being taught. It's not quite as popular as it once was. It basically argues that Christians need to keep their Muslim or Hindu identity, even to the point of worshiping in a Hindu temple or a Muslim mosque, in order to keep their connection to their family and social circles. Otherwise, they'll suffer unnecessarily and be ineffectual evangelistically. I heard a proponent of this view argue that baptism, now this is, when I say a proponent of this view, I mean a man who, if you've heard of Ralph Winter, right? If you've heard of Ralph Winter, his son-in-law, U.S. Center for World Missions. I, I, I document it in my book out there. You can look up the audio yourself. He argued that baptism is a Western imposition that ruins a person's connection to their community, so we should not require it of Christians. Disciple-making movements. Disciple-making movements. Um, this is probably the biggest movement in modern missions. Jesus commanded us to make disciples. Here's the premise. He commanded us to make disciples, not to plant churches. When you read there, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. The baptizing part, that's Western, don't tell Jesus. But the teaching, okay, that's something that we do in an interesting way as well, which I'll get to. But he commanded us to make disciples, not plant churches. Therefore, we find a person of peace, a POP. Here's the acronym. You're gonna, I'm going to acronym you to death. DMM, POP. You're going to be like, oh my gosh. A POP, a person of peace. It used to be called a man of peace, but that's not good to say anymore. So it's person of peace. Now you find a person of peace. That means you come to a nation where you're trying to bring the gospel. You say certain uh, words, these kind of gospel statements, and then somebody responds positively to them, and the person responds positively, like, like, God bless you. Oh, thank you very much. There's your person of peace. You've identified them. One of the largest sending organizations in this world actually um, said that their record was 47 seconds from the time their missionary la landed until the time that they identified the person of peace. They had prayed, and they had seen a red wheel and they saw a guy standing next to a, some kind of a cart with a red wheel, and they said, there he is, and that was a person of peace. So you find a person of peace whom you um, have gathered people together. So if you remember John Chow, the man who got killed going onto that island just outside of India, right? He was shouting out these kinds of phrases looking for a person of peace. That's, he found men of war, sadly. But we find the person of peace, we have him gather people, and then he leads the people. The person of peace leads the people as they read the Bible and interpret it together. Did you just catch that? The unbeliever who's friendly, he gathers a group of people, and he leads the Bible study of unbelievers. There is no Western teacher. They call this Discovery Bible Studies, DBS, Discovery Bible Studies. No Western teachers are allowed because that's imperialistic. 
right? That's, that's authoritarian. We don't, we don't do that kind of thing. Um, so when it says teaching them to obey or observe, it's actually having them teach themselves to obey, to obey. And then they, they, what they do is they get together in their group of unbelievers, led by the person of peace, as the missionary sort of coaches them along. And they have their discovery Bible study where they read a passage. They interpret the passage by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the claim, in case you're wondering, is what about error? The claim is that the Holy Spirit protects them from error and that error is only introduced by people who are seminary trained. I actually heard that, that that's been the, the, the seminaries have been the source of one of the speakers, Watson, um, I have the, uh, the video of him, said that, that seminaries have been the source of all errors throughout the history of the church. <laughs> There's a problem there. <laughs> if you don't know, seminaries haven't been around long enough to be that. But anyway, but they find a principle to obey, they obey it, and that's how they become disciples. And if you get a group like this of unbelievers reading the Bible together, obeying principles together that they interpret together, then you have a church. And if you get members of that group to grab some folks and start a second group, so one of those guys from your first group goes out and gets a group of people and has a second group, you have a second church. Now, now catch this, you need to have a movement because it's not okay to have church planting, you have to have a church planting movement or a disciple making movement. And how do you define a movement? Well, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Paul, first generation, teaching Timothy, second generation, to entrust these things to faithful men, third generation, who will teach them to others also, fourth generation. So once you've gotten to church number four, you now have a movement. And so you're now leading a church planting movement or a disciple making movement and that is the goal that's the goal um, that's why you hear these stories of hey this guy went over there and planted a thousand churches this year if you've tried to plant one church you know that's silly you know that a thousand churches this year huh wow well if they don't have to have believers in them that's easy <laughs> The displacement of the church as a sending agency is another issue. One of the doctrines of the church is a problem. The displacement of the church as the sending agency. Most missionaries I interact with um, in the evangelical world are self-selected, self-ordained, and self-sent. Their churches turn the responsibility of sending accountability and caring over to parachurch sending organizations. What happens is a young person goes to Cross or Urbana or one of these conferences, hears somebody speak about missions, gets all fired up and decides they're going to be a missionary. Their church pats them on the back, gives them a check and says, congratulations, way to go. And off they go and they find a sending organization and they take over from there. That's a huge error. That is just being replicated again and again with regard to the church. Third, third error. Under, an error in the understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit. So I, I'll, I've already defined these for you. But a pop, a person of peace, um, is an unbeliever leading the church by the power of the Holy Spirit as an unbeliever. Interpreting the Bible by the power of the Holy Spirit as an unbeliever. Um, discovery Bible studies, no teaching, no proc proclamation. The Holy Spirit will lead them. If you think I'm exaggerating, go watch my debate. One, one of the leaders, the, the guy I debate with is the leader of Missio Nexus, which is like a clearinghouse for lots of sending organizations. He was picked by the various sending organizations to be the guy who debates me. Go watch it. I mean, you'll just see. He just lays it right out there. Church planting movements, um, you know, are, are the kind of, if you will, this idea of getting church growth. Um, at explosive church growth from church to church to church where there is no church. There is no gospel being proclaimed. Um, another thing that's out there now is the, the side of movement with regard to Muslim dreams. Have you guys heard about this? So all these Muslims are having dreams allegedly um, and now they believe in Jesus. And so listen, it's a miracle happening in the Middle East. Jesus appears to them, he talks to them, now they believe in Jesus. I, I am friends with a Muslim cleric, uh, uh, he's an emir, which is, so there's imams and there's emirs, he's over four Sunni 
imams in the mosques in our area. And I took him to lunch one day and said, what do you think about the claims of all the Muslims in the Middle East having dreams of Jesus? He said, that's good. I said, it is. He says, yeah. Moses came to me in a dream and told me to obey the law. Jesus came to me in a dream and told me to obey the Injil. And Muhammad came to me in a dream and told me to obey the Quran. That's just how it works. Now, I was a little stunned by that. So I pressed these missiologists on the question, these guys who speak in these circles. Well, if someone says they had a dream of Jesus, but they still believe Muhammad's a prophet, are they converted to Christ? Yes. Really, Muhammad, who wrote the Quran, who said, say not Trinity, right? That person's a Christian. Yes. Fourth, an errant understanding of God's written revelation. An errant understanding of God's written revelation. Um, you know, the PCA dealt with this with Muslim idiom translations. With the, the, PC, the PCA had a study report on, on um, son of God language and translation in Muslim contexts. Uh, that was quite good, actually. But one of the claims that's out there is you can't translate the language son of God because that will offend Muslims. Um, so Wycliffe was leaving out the son of God in translation. Um, but son of God is not merely language we find that's helpful. It's revealing God to us. Now I could go on. There's, there's more. Um, T4T, bam. Evangy cubes. Yes, there's such a thing. Orality. The idea that we don't translate the Bible for people and give them a copy of it in their own language. We just um, record ourselves and they listen to it. Now as Presbyterians, you believe in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Go read chapter one and see what you think, of what it says that we believe confessionally about the translation of the Bible into common languages. But they just deny the need for that. The Jesus film. Okay, so I'm in a group where this is like red meat. Second commandment violation, moving on, right? But let me, let me take it a step further. Let me take it a step further than that. What do you think an animist, not a monotheist, an animist who hears the, or, or you drop into the animist context, you show him the Jesus film. Suddenly there's some Jewish guy They've never heard of a Jewish guy walking around doing miracles, talking about he's the Messiah. They have no context for that. He's the one who heals people. What do you think they're hearing and seeing when they watch that? Because they have no understanding of who God is, what man is, what sin is. They have what, what little truth they do have. They've suppressed an unrighteousness to the point that it's like a distant memory. What do you think they hear? Well, that God is better than all the rest. Let's add him to the top of the pile. You can't just drop into another language and culture and start preaching the gospel and think that you do not have to do the polemical work of understanding their language and culture and worldview so that you can, if you will, almost beginning with Moses, unveil the problems in all of their thinking so that they understand who God is, what their problem is, and how Jesus is the answer to that problem. An errant understanding of training, qualifying, and sending. The evangelical church often confuses urgency with hastiness. In their zeal to get people to the field quickly, they send anyone who can fog a mirror on a cold morning. <laughs> There's no real commitment to thorough training, Slowly qualifying and sending only our best. There's no real commitment to that. Our best stay here and build the big churches for us. Now it's easy to smack around all the bad stuff out there, all the low-hanging fruit among ev evangelicals. Let's deal with the issues that likely lurk about in this room and our own hearts and our own churches and among us. So let's deal with the higher-hanging fruit of reformed errors and missions. I want to address 
errors that I think exist in the contemporary Reformed Church. Now, let me say this with regard to what I just said about evangelicals and what I'm about to say about the Reformed community. I have not done a, I'm not, I'm not George Barna, I haven't done a survey or done a Ligonier survey. I, I don't know all of your churches, nor do I know all of their churches. What I'm speaking about in everything I'm saying is based on my anecdotal experience, talking to sending agencies, meeting mission missionaries, talking to pastors. This is what I observe. So I don't mean that all Reformed folk participate in the errors I'm about to say, and I don't mean that all evangelical folk participate in the errors I just named. That's not what I mean. I'm merely speaking anecdotally, but let me address four errors that I see too often. How about that? That I see too often. You might call these errors errors of putting the emphasis in the wrong place. You know, Lloyd-Jones talks about the danger of the error of putting the emphasis in the wrong place. You, you might call it that. So let's talk about those. First, there's four of them I want to give. First, a lack of conviction regarding eternal judgment. Our Lord Jesus speaks of the conscious, eternal torments of hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. We all confess in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question and answer 19, what is the misery of that estate wherein two men fell? All mankind, by their fall, lost communion with God, or under his wrath and curse, and so made liable to all, now listen, to all the miseries of this life, to death itself, and to the pains of hell forever. But do we really believe that? Do we really believe that there are billions of people who are condemned in their sin and subject, now listen to the last phrase, to the pains of hell forever? Over 100 years ago, we saw the foreign missions efforts among the Presbyterians descend into a kind of social gospel. J. Gresham Machen addressed that in his book, Christianity and Liberalism. The church in his day was concerned chiefly about the miseries of this life. But there was not much concern about the pains of hell forever. Frankly, I think this particular lack of conviction drives much of what I'm seeing in whatever label you want to call it today in the evangelical reform world, whether you stick to label Christian nationalism on it, I, I, I don't really care. Like, I'm a Christian, and I'm proudly patriotic. I, I don't know what that makes me. A Christian and an American, I guess. But what's happened is, is that there's a kind of social gospel for conservative folk bent toward undoing the miseries of this life that is growingly prevalent. Now, I'm not arguing that we should hide in some corner and let our country slide into Gomorrah. That's not my point. With that said, I'm really concerned that our primary attention is on the temporal and earthly problems that face us, rather, the, in other words, the miseries of this life, and our focus is not on the eternal pains of hell to come. I drive around Greenville, which is just, is, as a Californian, you have to understand. I, I hear this all the time when I come to the South or these places, like, you live in a different country. And until I come here, I don't realize, it's true, I actually do, <laughs> called California. When I come out here, I'm driving around and I see a, a city littered with massive churches. Massive churches all over the place. And I want to say to the young ministers of the seminarians, I want to say, get thee to California. There are 40 million people who do not know their right hand from the left and also much cattle. There, there is. There's a lot of cattle in California. But I would suspect most of us would rather join the exodus out of California than go to California. Far more importantly, there are whole people groups. Listen, far more importantly, there are whole people groups, ethno-linguistically distinct groups of people, millions and millions of souls who suffer not only the miseries of this life, but who will certainly suffer the pains of eternal hell. They have no gospel witness. We have churches in California. Do we have enough of them? Are they good enough? 
No, but we have Bibles in our language. We have seminaries. Is it your favorite seminary maybe out there? No, you're here. There are opportunities for Californians to hear the gospel and to reject it. Less opportunities maybe than here in Greenville, but there are still opportunities. But there are no, listen, zero opportunities for these unreached people groups. Zero. How does that shape our preaching? Ministers, how does that shape your preaching? Our prayers in our church. Our training. The way we raise up members. Do we give them a consciousness of a lost and dying world with no witness to Jesus Christ? Our sending. Our budgets. How does that affect all that? Here's the objection I often hear. Well, first, let's deal with our problems at home. In fact, when Greenville posted that they were doing a missions conference, little internet trolls started posting, what about the problems in America? Then we can go deal with the problems in the other nations. And so I want to ask, was that the command of our Lord and Savior? Is that what Jesus commanded the apostles? Make Jerusalem great again, then worry about the rest of the world. Is that what he said? Is that what we see the apostles doing in Acts? Do they wait for everything to be set right in Jerusalem before the gospel goes to Samaria or to the Gentiles? Was Antioch exactly where it needed to be as a city with their church before they sent Paul and Barnabas to be missionaries? Was the church at Rome and the city where she was located turned around before Paul was about to head for Spain? The objection I often hear is this. Well, we're following the missions paradigm that was given to the apostles. You know what the missions paradigm is? Acts 1.8. This is what I'm told. It's a paradigm, apparently. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And here's what I hear. Well, this is a paradigm for our missions program. Greenville is our Jerusalem. Maybe Taylor's or somewhere is our Judea. And then Charleston is Samaria, certainly. California, that's the ends of the earth. And that's like a mission. Do you, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, those are historical cities and places. We know that, right? They, they actually were places the apostles were to go. Acts 1-8 is not a paradigm for our missions. It's a prophetic promise, a promise that Christ will pour out his spirit at Pentecost and begin the restoration of Israel. He will bring in the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel and the Gentile nations into this restored Israel. That's what it's talking about. It's not a paradigm. And we began to see the fulfillment of that played out in the book of Acts. Acts 1.8 is telling us the progression of the going forth of the gospel to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the Gentile nations through the ministry of the apostles. Let me deal with the second error of emphasis I think lurks among us. The second error a general, uh, of emphasis, a general malaise about preaching the gospel to the unreached languages of the world. A general malaise that I think exists among those I've seen. Remember I said that the evangelicals see the urgency. They sense the urgency. But they're really hasty. My concern for the reform community is we don't have enough of a sense of urgency. We need to gee, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Okay, let's get a committee together and talk about this for the next five years. See what our plan's going to be. Obey it. Now, I'm not saying you don't have to do some planning. Some work and some training and sending. I'm not saying any of that. But we believe that the only name under heaven by which men must be saved is the name of Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. We believe that everyone who calls the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved, but friends, how can they call on him of whom they've never believed? 
And how are they to believe in him whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear unless someone preaches? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? So I was asked to, to address problems in modern missions in this session. And saints, when it comes to reaching the unreached language of the world, the Presbyterian and Reformed Church today is largely missing in action. We write a lot of good books. We raise up a lot of good scholars. We put up some really good fights at general assemblies. But we send precious few gospel ministers to unreached peoples. And here's what bothers me about this. You know, we used to own this ground. When I was in Vanuatu, I'm uh, Radius, we're making a series of films. So Greenville is in partnership with us on this in the conference, missionary conference in October. We're making a series of biographical films. Um, that we're going to put out on historic missionaries. We were one of the films we're making is on John G. Payton. I was in Vanuatu, used to be called the New Hebrides. I was in Vanuatu filming. While we were there, we were at the places where John G. Payton ministered. We went to a few of the different islands where some other uh, Presbyterian ministers were. But here was the thing that struck me: every island we landed on. We'd meet the people. Oh, we're Christians. Really, you are? Yes. This is our Presbyterian church. Every island dominated by Presbyterian. You all would be like, yes. This is amazing. It was so encouraging. Presbyterians went to India and China and Africa and Indonesia to carry the gospel where it had never been before. Where have we gone when it comes to the peoples who have never heard the name of Christ? Let me press this a bit further. I came to confessional reform theology slowly, painfully, slowly. I was the last man on my session to come to confessional reform convictions, and I was a senior pastor. How'd you guys get here ahead of me from your Bible teaching? Oh, okay. Thank you. That's great. I remember that in part I was nervous. I. And I think part of my holdup was I was nervous that I was joining some kind of ecclesiological cul-de-sac where you all smothered one another to death over small degrees of doctrinal difference. While the entire world out there who has never heard of your confessions is dying and plunging into eternal hell without Christ. Now I came to understand that these confessions do not suffocate us, they actually free us. They are the cream, the gold standard, the, um, it, the full flower of the Protestant Reformation as to doctrine. Our standards are the best summary of biblical truth I know. And, and I've, um, I just wonder why we're not shouting them from the rooftops. I've often heard Ian Hamilton, who's a close friend of mine, say, that, say this phrase. I never heard it until I actually was at Greenville um, for a class for him, uh, I'm a Yuri Devino Presbyterian. In other words, our Presbyterianism, Presbyterianism is given by God in his divine word. I believe that. And that's right. Brothers and sisters, if we are those who argue that our doctrine and practice is given as divine law, then we do not get to escape the bar of judgment when it comes to Christ's, our obedience to Christ's final command. Look, Matthew 28, 16. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Now, if you've heard Dr. Morales talk about mountains in the Bible, um, let me just say, if you haven't, please do. But if you have, then you understand that God meets people on his mountain. Eden, Ararat, Sinai, Carmel, the temple, the tabernacle, Zion, the Mount of Transfiguration, and here in Galilee. I, I could go on. Christ met the apostles, those whose ministry is the foundation of the church, here on this mountain and commanded them to make disciples to the Pontata Ethne, to, to all the peoples, every tribe and language and nation. So my question is, are we Yuri Divino Presbyterians with regard to this command? 
Here is divine law coming down from the Lord of glory and grace, and here he is commanding our church practice. If we really understand the glorious doctrine so beautifully articulated in our own confessional standards, and if our hearts and ministries are really shaped by them, then we want nothing more than to shout that glorious truth to every tribe and tongue and nation. I do not mean that we're cagey, that we want to run around to other churches and argue with them. I mean that we want to look at our neighbors and we want to look at the people across the world and we want to say to them, have you heard of this marvelous grace in Christ? Have you heard of this grace given to me before times eternal but manifested in history in Jesus Christ? Do you know Jesus, the grace of God who appeared to save his people? How can we keep that from lost people? Doesn't, don't, aren't we at all moved to want to lay down our very lives, our families, our possessions to proclaim Christ and eternal life in him? I often wonder if our inactivity betrays a suspicion about the reality of hell and the exclusivity of Christ for salvation. Maybe we don't really meditate on and find joy and eternal life in the glorious presence of Christ. I, I'm not really sure what I do know is that true Yuri Divino Presbyterianism looks a lot more like seminaries as nurseries for missionaries and a lot and, and churches as sending agencies to the nations. And Yuri Divino Presbyterianism looks a lot less like seminaries and churches as citadels in which we hide the secrets of our confessional heritage under a bushel of battles over minor doctrinal differences that exist within our own camp. That leads me to the third error of emphasis I see among us. Three, a lack of conviction regarding the Holy Spirit. A lack of conviction regarding the Holy Spirit being sent to empower the church to fulfill her missionary calling. The Holy Spirit's been given to us so that Christ's name might be made known in all the earth, in and through the new covenant church. Remember when Jesus told the apostles in Luke 49, or 24, sorry, 49, but I'll just go back to verse 46, Luke 24. Jesus said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Same phrase in Greek as what you had in Matthew 28, 19. Pontata ethne. Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. That's the promise of the Holy Spirit. But stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Then we read about the ascension. The Holy Spirit was not first given so that the gospel might be protected from false teachers. He was first given so that Christ might be believed on in the world. So that Christ's work would be applied to us. With that said... Missions certainly can be the leading edge of theological downgrade, can't it? Carl Truman once rightly said to me, uh, Chad, with his English accent, sounds much better, more informed and intelligent just by the accent alone. Missions is often the tip of the spear of heresy. So yes, we must be committed to guarding the confessional gate. But if in our fights for confessional orthodoxy, in our fights for confessional orthodoxy, we can tend to commit a serious error of emphasis. We become so zealous to guard the confessional gate that we forget to go to the highways and byways and call people to the faith that we confess. We nearly forget that the same Apostle Paul who warned the Ephesian elders of error and who commanded them to guard the flock and their own hearts also said, but I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received in Lord Jesus, to what? To testify to the gospel of the grace of God. The same apostle who wrote the glorious doctrinal treaty, treaties we find in Romans 1 through 11, also wrote, I make it my ambition, like it's my highest honor to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. 
But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, those who have never heard will understand. Friends, we devote enormous amounts of energy and funds to better and better Bible translation in English, better commentaries, better study Bibles, better seminaries, better children's curriculum, better everything. And please don't misunderstand me. I am deeply thankful for all these resources. I'm in no way condemning those who labor in their production. I'm not in any way opposing those who bring, for example, overtures to a general assembly to deal with error. I'm also in no way downplaying the importance of rigorous seminary education or even building a better library at Greenville. No way am I doing that. <laughs> be bad as a guest to do that. But, but let, me, let me spin this on the positive. Greenville on their website has now posted that they want to be a nursery for missionaries. That's coming from old Princeton. They want to be a nursery for missionaries. I do not know how Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary can become a true nursery for missionaries if they fail to raise up gospel ministers with biblically rich, academically rigorous, and confessionally faithful teaching. And saints, this seminary, I want to say this because I've been to a lot of them. I'm at two more of them in the next two weeks. This seminary gets that like few I have ever seen. This seminary has doubled down in their commitment to that end. Not only do they have the MDiv partnership with Radius for missionary church planters, but it's now appearing in all of their language. We're seeing them come um, and joining with Radius on this missionary conference. They, I know that Jonathan's heart is to, and his board, I'm assuming, since they are behind him, is committed to seeing a kind of... Um, pardon the word, kind of revival among Presbyterians in sending forth missionaries to the unreached peoples of the earth. Here's what I'm trying to say. I'm saying that the end, the goal of all this training, is not to win over the PCA or the OPC or the ARP or whoever. The goal is to see Christ named in every tribe and tongue and nation. Even the winning of your denominations to confessional faithfulness is a means to that great end. The end that Christ might be exalted in and exalted among every language on the earth. So please refute those who contradict. We must do that. We've been commanded to do that. It'd be disobedient not to do that. But we must not lose sight of the over 3,000 people groups who have zero access to the gospel, zero access to a Bible, zero churches, no confessions, they never heard of such a thing, and no hope of eternal life. They have no children's programs, no new Trinity Psalter hymnals, no church buildings, no building expansion projects. They have no presbyteries or GAs to fight in. To some of you, that might sound a little dreamy at times. <laughs> we are often building ever nicer facilities with little sense of urgency for those nations with no gospel at all. If we really believe that the Holy Spirit has been sent to empower the church for gospel witness in every tribe and tongue and nation, and that he really works through the ordinary means of grace so that Christ is known in all the earth, then we should be those who are captured by the spirit of missions. If we're truly overwhelmed by the love of God for, um, for us in Christ, and if our hearts have been captured by a love for Christ because of that, then the spirit of missions is our heartbeat, and it's the heartbeat of our church, because it's the heartbeat of our Savior. Saints, our churches must send forth our best and brightest to the ends of the earth, and our pain in seeing those we love depart our sacrifices in giving them and our money with them to the nations, our prayers poured out regularly for them, our walking with them through their sufferings for the sake of Christ will not, will not diminish our doctrinal convictions and our personal piety. It will strengthen them. Their going will not hinder our confessional fidelity. If anything, it will cause us to be deadly serious about our doctrine. Brothers, people I love, I mean husbands and, wi and their wife and their children, who I love, who I know, who I've walked with, have gone to some of the most difficult places on earth 
to proclaim Christ. I watch them suffer. I interact with them. I see them cry pretty much every time we talk because it's hard, difficult. They don't know what will come of their children. They don't know how they're going to make it their long term. They, it's just everything in them to put one foot forward in front of the other and keep going. When those are the people you love, who your church prays for and sends and interacts with on a regular basis, you end up like me. I have zero time and even less tolerance for so-called gospel ministers who want to fool about with confessional integrity and undermine the gospel by, with the death of a thousand qualifications. Just none. We're watching our fellow members give their lives for these doctrines. There's a blood earnestness about it. That sacrifice does not undermine our convictions, it emboldens them. At one point in his book, John Layton Wilson, which there's a book by John Layton Wilson out there, rightly asked, does anyone seriously believe that the church will ever make shipwreck of the faith or destroy her own life and power by following too closely in the footsteps of her great leader. Finally, let me turn to the fourth error and wrap up. A lack of ministerial conviction regarding losing ourselves for the sake of God's elect. I really want to address ministers and seminary students among us. When Christ entrusts us his gospel, trust that to us and his church, when you trust that to those of us who are ministers, we must understand that this is a sacred calling and duty. We are to share in suffering as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. We lay down everything and endure everything for the sake of the elect. We are joyfully poured out as a drink offering for the sake of Christ's church. Christ himself is our reward. Our lives are not to be distracted by secular concerns. We're to run the race to the end. We're to be like hard-working farmers. We put our hands to the plow and we do not look back. We know that foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests and the Son of Man has no way to lay, nowhere to lay his head and we count it our privilege to follow him there. But I fear that many men entering the ministry are not suitably prepared for and sober about the nature of our service. We often love the comfort of our personal studies more than the difficulties of our members' living rooms. So we stay in the study and avoid pastoral visitation. We can become more interested in competing for the local Christian customer base with better preaching, better programs, better facilities than with the difficulties of chasing wandering sheep and searching for lost sheep. And so we invest our, in our efforts to continually improve our amenities rather than pursuing the lost and wandering sheep. We can become far more interested in serving our home congregations than in going to the unreached of the earth. And so rather than asking the Lord where he wants to allocate his soldiers, we tell him where we will serve. Seminary students, I hear this from seminary students all the time, and I'm just going to give you a little analogy. Um, when I was in basic training in the Army, I never called my commanding officer to inform him where I'd be serving. <laughs> my field of battle. He allocated soldiers to where he deemed it wise to allocate them. So this notion of you showing up for training already knowing where you're headed is a complete misunderstanding of your rank among Christ's soldiers. If you're a seminary student here, you don't know where you're headed when you walk in this door. If you do say that you already have decided it, that, as far as I'm concerned, it's most likely arrogance. You come to seminary to prepare yourself to lay down your life on whatever field of battle the commander of the Lord's army is keen to send you. And frankly, your first thought ought to be, I want to go wherever the need is the greatest. Pastors and elders, when we're raising up faithful men to whom we entrust the gospel, we can become jealous to keep such men around as a benefit to our own work. I mean, one of 
my elders, is now here as a seminary student. He's actually um, Dr. Master's assistant, and it gutted us to send him to South Carolina. You don't think we need more help in California? You know we need more help in California. <laughs> gutted us. I don't know where he's going to end up. I'd like him to end up back at my church so we can be together the rest of our lives as friends doing ministry side by side. That's what I'd like. But I don't get to arrange things so that I'm comfortable. It guts us to send out our best and brightest. I want to keep all these men running alongside me for life. And herein is my point. It's quite easy for ministers, most of all me, to find ways to justify our failure to do our duty. It's easy to become those who love comfort more than Christ because seeking comfort is so endemic to our fallen nature. It's un utterly unnatural to our fallen flesh to be poured out as a drink offering for the sake of Christ's church. I said that I was engaged in filming a series of missionary biographies. One of those is on John Payton, as I said. I will never forget standing over the grave of his wife and child that he buried in Tana. He laid there on their grave, not just to weep, but to protect their bodies from being eaten by the islanders who were persecuting him. He lived in a truly miserable location where he served and sacrificed for four years. I will also not soon forget being on Aniwa, where he served for another 14 years plus and lost more children and saw the church born. Peyton lost six of his 10 children in missions among the unreached. Six of his 10 children. And he wanted to send the other four precious children he had left into missions among the unreached. L listen to his prayer for his own children. I deeply rejoice when I breathe that prayer that it may please the blessed Lord to turn the hearts of all my children to the mission field. He's already given six of his children to the mission field. And that he may open up their way and make it their pride and joy to live and die in carrying Jesus and his gospel into the heart of the heathen world. Do we pray like that for our children? For our up-and-coming gospel ministers? See, we need ministers and elders who understand this. We need to send our best and brightest to the hardest and darkest places on earth. We do not want to be those who look at our most gifted young men and say, stay here. We want to be those who look at them and say, go there. This means we need to say goodbye to our loved ones and realize our next greeting may be in the presence of the Lord. See, it's, it's when our pastors and elders get this. It's when they get this that Presbyterians will recapture our once great missions efforts and perhaps improve upon them. I want you to hear what J.W. Alexander said with regard to this in an article he wrote on foreign missions, uh, one of the Princeton Scholars, it is, our pa it is our pastors, hear this, it is our pastors, we must repeat it, and earnestly and most respectfully ask attention to the remark, it is our pastors with whom the work of missions must rise or fall. Under God it is they who must bid it live or die. Let a thousand ministers arise to their feet and join shoulder to shoulder in this work, and no man doubts that the whole land would be moved and more than our brightest dreams realized. Let's ask the Lord to do that work. Father, we come before you asking you to work in our pastors, our sessions, our presbyteries in such ways that we rise to our feet and join shoulder to shoulder in this work of making Christ known in the areas where he has never been named, among the peoples who've never heard of him. We long to be obedient to your command. The love of Christ compels us to want to lay down our lives so that Christ is named in all the earth. May we see this as our highest honor 
to be those who proclaim the name of Jesus to a lost and dying world, may you be pleased to raise up missionaries from this number of people, from the churches represented here. May you bless the work of these churches and of Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary as they grow more and more into the role of being a nursery for missionaries. May you bless the needs that they have with being filled so that they can bring in more students and equip them more thoroughly and send them to every tribe and tongue and nation so that Christ might be known in all the earth. May we be those who have been not only blessed with the most glorious exposition of the biblical gospel, who hold it in our hands and read it in our churches, but may we be those who are similarly moved to proclaim that gospel to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to sing, um, if you will, join me in singing, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, which is right on the session. Um, it's just the next page from Holy God, we praise your name. If you'd stand with us. Amen. You're dismissed until our next session, which begins promptly at 3.30.
Well, we're ready to get started in our next session. We're ready to get started for our next session, so if you could please find your seats. It's 3.31, and we need to keep things moving. Uh, my name is Pat Daly, and I'm privileged to serve here as the Vice President, and I have a couple announcements for you as we get seated. And uh, before the next session begins, we might let a couple people trickle in first. All right, for those of you who are punctual and the most beloved of our attendees, um, I have a couple announcements for you. Uh, one of them, if you have your conference program, Dr. Master already, already pointed out just how important it is to keep this program with you. If you have that open, it might be helpful as I uh, explain a couple things. At the fourth page, you find the facility map where it lists facility and exhibitors. And there's a legend that explains a couple things about the campus here at the church. And one of the areas that is described is the children's area. And I just want to speak a little bit about what that is and what it isn't. So we do offer nursery during our evening sessions. We'll have nursery workers in the children area. And we also have a nursing mother's room, which has water for nursing mothers and some privacy. So please avail yourself of those spaces. That's what it is. What it isn't is just a place for you to dump your kids off and they can kind of run wild, okay? Well, actually, one of those places doesn't exist at the church. So please uh, keep, just keep watch of your kids as they enjoy their time here. We're thankful for all the children. It's really a blessing at our conference that we have so many uh, young children with us. In fact, there's a young lady by the name of Emma Mooney who made it her birthday wish to get a ticket to the Greenville Spring Theology Conference. So she's walking among us. If you see Emma, wish her happy birthday. Uh, she has very good parents who give her really good priorities. So we're thankful. That's just a reminder. We're thankful for Emma. We're thankful for many of our young children. And uh, we're glad that they can be with us this week. One other thing, if you go back to the schedule, which is at the beginning of your program, there's a couple optional events that are listed there. Definitely look through those and, and uh, make yourself aware of what's going on throughout the week. Most of these will be tomorrow, which is our full day. And there's one, however, there's one error under the seminary tours heading. It lists the location for the seminary tour as the cave, but you're probably thinking, I bet you that seminary tour is going to be at the seminary. And you would be right. So just note that, that that's an error. The seminary tours, which are tomorrow, um, when are they? Tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow at lunch, will be uh, meeting at the seminary. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Westminster Presbyterian Church in Battleground, Washington, who have kindly uh, sponsored the sweaters that we've given away at registration. So we're thankful for their friendship and their generosity, and so we can make that available to you. Also, speaking of merchandise, one of our goals is to merch the world with Greenville Seminary merchandise. And we have a special sale on in the bookstore, all uh, sweaters, sweatshirts. I don't know the difference between a sweater and a sweatshirt, but they're there. Uh, windbreakers, hats, they're all available for $15. They're all on sale during the conference. So definitely want to check them out. They won't last long. So go ahead and check those out. And then also some of you have been asking where you can find water or water bottles and coffee. All food will be available in the dining hall and the fellowship hall, which is just behind us. You probably found it already. There's lots of water, lots of coffee. So please uh, check that out if you're thirsty. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone to our second session of the day here. I have the privilege uh, this afternoon of introducing dear brother in the Lord, Dr. David Gilbert. Uh, David Gilbert is the pastor of Grace Presbyterian Church in Douglasville, Georgia. He's here with his wife, Michelle, and daughters. Uh, we're glad to have him with us. Uh, he served there in Douglasville for the last 10 years. Prior to that, for about a decade as well, he served in Second Presbyterian Church in Yazoo City. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gilbert uh, recently earned his D-Men in preaching uh, from RTS Charlotte. Uh, but above all, I'm very thankful for our brother, his love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And he comes to us uh, to proclaim uh, the word of the Lord to us. Well, as we get ready for that, let us stand together to sing our opening hymn, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. Uh, you'll find it on the page uh, right after the session two page for notes.
Let's pray together. O oh Lord our God, your name is truly worthy of all glory and honor and praise. Oh, you are the one who has created all of this vast universe. Oh, Lord, you know all of the creatures of your hands. You know each one of us through and through. Oh, you know every man, woman, and child to the ends of the earth and in heaven and in hell. Oh, Lord, our God, we pray that you would bless us uh, with the manna from above, that you would give us your word uh, once again abundantly, that you would convict us uh, where we need to be convicted. Oh, Lord, open our eyes to see our sin. Open our eyes to see you as our great God and Savior, uh, to love you more, to be impelled to greater service for you. Oh, Lord, we pray that you would move in us by your Spirit and increase in us a holy passion for the glory of your name. We pray that you'd bless our speaker, Brother David Gilbert, bless him as he brings your word to us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. What a delight it is to be with you all and to join our hearts together as we consider the glorious gospel of King Jesus and the progress of that gospel throughout the world. As we think on the theme generally, uh, we are turning to the book of Acts. You may have wondered as you looked uh, as to what was going to be covered, a new perspective. I'm not giving a lecture on the new perspective. We are thinking of a new perspective that the Lord gives his apostle Peter in the book of Acts and chapter 10, and you can make your way there. As we see, Christ will be growing his church through the outpouring of his spirit. Uh, you'll remember that Acts, as already told us, was there's a declaration at the beginning of the historical progression of the gospel, which is not a paradigm we heard already, but as Jesus would clothe his apostles with the power of the Holy Spirit to carry the gospel from Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Well, we are in the end of the earth section as we come to Acts chapter 10. And before I read this passage of scripture, let us seek the Lord together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come with our heart ready to hear from you. We come knowing our need to be instructed by your word. We come utterly dependent upon your Holy Spirit to work in us, to open our ears to the truth and to ready our hearts to welcome that we would tremble at your word. And Lord, we pray that your word, which is living and active, would do its work now in us. We pray that you would grant understanding to us, to the glory of your great name, for we pray it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, if you'll listen as I read Acts chapter 10, I'll be reading through verse 29. Acts 10, verses 1 to 29. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household and gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa, and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were on their journey in approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners 
upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you were looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you, to come to his house, and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many persons gathered, and he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked them, why you sent for me. This is the word of the living God, and may he press its truth to our hearts. Well, in Luke's narrative of King Jesus advancing the gospel through the apostles, he's touched on the Gentiles receiving Christ. We've seen the Ethiopian eunuch and Peter's visit to Joppa where Tabitha was raised But those are only the first drips of what we might call a great gospel deluge to the Gentiles. And that flood now starts with a man named Cornelius. Now, Peter and the other apostles didn't doubt that the gospel would go to the Gentiles. Isaiah and the Psalms spoke of it frequently. And Jesus, of course, himself had ministered to the Gentiles. Yet there were practical questions Involved, and they were significant. How can unclean Gentiles receive the gospel? How could those who were uncircumcised be accepted? How could Jew and Gentile share Christ when they didn't even share food? These are major issues, and they signal things that make the new covenant new. In the old covenant, the Lord put his children under a guardianship. They were given the elementary principles of the law as being tutored, which of course served to protect them from Canaanite corruption in particular. And one of those laws, actually a whole set of them we might say, pertained to food, clean and unclean. Now we know it's not that certain food was inherently evil. God was rather teaching his people that they were to be set apart unto the Lord, holy for him. And that same principle of holiness still holds for us. But in the new covenant, the ceremonial laws, like the dietary restrictions, are abrogated. They cease, like the sacrificial system. Well, this is a huge change if you're a Jew. Your whole life has been lived only eating certain things, only being around those who are clean. But the Jews often missing the spiritual tutelage of the law, frequently drew the wrong conclusions about these distinctions. They come to think of themselves as superior to the Gentiles. 
and they thought their outward actions like ceremonial hand washing, per se, made them holy. Now you remember Mark chapter 7, Jesus expressly taught, it is not something unclean on the outside going into us that defiles us. Our defilement comes from within, out of our own hearts. And in saying this, Mark comments that Jesus declared all foods clean. Well, Mark is saying this in hindsight, but Peter is going to have to learn the principle. He's going to have to gain a new perspective. Being the people of God is not about what you wear or what you eat or having a certain mark in the flesh. It's about receiving and resting upon Christ alone as he, had offer, as he is offered in the gospel. And as we think about Peter's new perspective, I want you to ponder three things in this passage with me. Now it will become quickly apparent to you that Chad Vegas has already read my notes and has said a number of things that I'm going to say. And it's striking to me that he could be in such a far off land and still know what I'm doing. It's always amazing in the providence of God how he works those things out. But as we come to see God's providence and his sovereign power at work, that's where we begin in this text, sovereignty and obedience in verses 1 to 9. Now, Luke takes us to Caesarea. It's about 30 miles up the coast from where Peter is in Joppa. And here we're going to meet Cornelius. He was, Luke tells us, a centurion of the Italian cohort. Uh, likely the local militia, if we think of it like that, for the city, and Cornelius is the captain. And yet this Roman man who hung around with soldiers, not the kind of guy you would expect to be pious, he is, verse 2, a devout man who feared God with his household. Now, you know the language of a God-fearer identifies a Gentile with an attachment to the God of Israel. He hasn't become a Jew in full, but he's linked himself to the Jews. He would be going to synagogue, hearing the Old Testament preached, looking for the Messiah, living by the ethical principles of the law of God. He had a reverence for the one true God. The Lord is working in this man. Cornelius, not yet knowing Jesus is the Christ, but yet looking for the Christ, has been awakened to a sense of his sin and a need for a savior. God is drawing this man, stirring his soul, and the proof of God at work is seen in his acts. Do you see that? He's leading his household to fear God. He's giving alms generously. And verse 2, at the end there, he prayed continually to God. Now, just a brief thing here about Cornelius. He has not yet come to a saving understanding of Jesus Christ. He is still in the realm of old covenant and needs to transition to rest in Jesus. But God is working in his grace. And what does God's grace always do in God's people? Grace teaches us to fear the Lord. God's people have their ups and downs and devotion to be sure, but the grace that saves us is grace that trains us. And that was happening in Cornelius' life. My dear friends, is it happening in your life? Are we conscious first of God's amazing grace to make us understand the truth, to give us the gift of faith, to draw us to see Christ and our need of him? And then with a fear of the Lord, do we devote ourselves to the Lord, zealous for good works? That's the path this man is on. And in the midst of his devotion to God in prayer, on a particular day, verse 3, about the ninth hour, and that's significant, 3 p.m. by our reckoning, corresponding to the time of the evening sacrifice, by even praying at that time, Cornelius seems to understand that he cannot approach God except by means of a sacrifice that God himself has provided. He's not in Jerusalem, but he's recognizing a connection to the sin offering there. And Cornelius comes with thanksgiving, no doubt, for a way to approach God, and he has a vision. Verse 3, an angel of God addressed him, Cornelius, don't miss that personal address. 
a pathos, a tenderness, an intimacy. God knows his own by name. He doesn't merely have a general care for believers. His care of us, his attention to us, his directions for us are tailor-made. That's not just for the important people like the apostles. The Lord knows this man's name in some populous Gentile city who's still on the outside of the New Testament church. Look at God's sovereignty and care. And then like so many people in the scripture who encounter an angel, there's an immediate fear. Fear in light of the supernatural. Fear due to the grasp of your own sin. Fear knowing that God's holy messengers are also messengers of his judgment. But here, fear is dissipated as the angel comes with a gracious word. You see it in verse 4. Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Cornelius, the way that you live rises to God like an offering. It's sacrificial language. Your life is seen as a sacrifice to God. What a comfort it is to know, beloved, that while we are called to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, the Lord sees our devotion. He sees our labors. And while God's grace moves us to expressions of devotion, to serve him as we ought to serve him, the Lord still blesses us for being devoted. What kindness. We give God what he is due as unprofitable servants, and he yet showers his favor on us. That is occurring here with Cornelius. He's a godly believer living at the moment by what he knows, but the Lord is about to give this man more light to bring him to the knowledge of Christ. But here's the crucial question. How will Cornelius hear of Jesus? How will he learn of the gospel? Well, the angel could just tell him, right? He's having a vision of an angel speaking to him. Surely that would be the way. Or Jesus could just speak to him from heaven. That's what he does with the Apostle Paul, who is Saul of Tarsus in the previous chapter. Well, both things could happen. But that is not God's ordinary way. Now, you could quickly say, nothing in this chapter is ordinary. We have an angel appearing. Well, that's true. This is an extraordinary vision. But the Lord is still going to teach Cornelius the gospel in an ordinary fashion. That is striking. The Spirit of God is teaching us that God's sovereign means for bringing the gospel to anyone for salvation is the proclamation of that gospel through a man. How will Cornelius call on Jesus as Lord if he hasn't heard of all that Jesus has done? If he hasn't heard all that Jesus is? And how is he going to hear if there's no one preaching to him? And how can that preacher come to him unless one is sent to Cornelius? That is the way the gospel goes to these people. It's God's unchanging way from apostolic times in the extraordinary to present day times in what we might call the ordinary. The Lord sees needy souls clinging to the edges of truth, and he sends ambassadors to announce the saving mercies of Jesus Christ. For the Lord will save his people, but he is pleased to use us in weakness and the folly of what we preach. What an incredible privilege to announce the message of Jesus Christ, that he would use us as his means. Well, here Peter's the means, and he's going to be sent. Now the vision lays out the specifics, and we shouldn't miss the details here of God's sovereignty. Verse 5, Cornelius is told, send men to Joppa, bring one who is Simon, who is called Peter. Do you see the details? Go to this exact town. Get this exact guy. Let me give you his name among the Greek-speaking people to make sure you know exactly who he is. It's Peter. And then the Lord doesn't just give Cornelius a name with no address. Verse 6. No, he's lodging with one Simon, a tanner, 
whose house is by the sea. Do you know how hard it is to find someone in this room? Can you imagine how hard it would be to find someone in this city? But every detail is provided. Do you see the meticulous control of the Lord right here? It's like the scenes where Jesus sends his disciples to go to a certain place to get a donkey's colt for him and what to say to them. Or meet a man in a, carrying a water jar, follow him, and go to the place to prepare the meal in the upper room. Our God's rule over all things is not a general governance without the details. The Lord rules the practically insignificant things of life, like when a sparrow is going to fall to the ground, down to the number of hairs on our head. He knows our rising up, our lying down, our tears, our weaknesses, our gifts, our callings. He knows where we are, what we need, and how to get us what we need. Now, friends, we're not receiving visions telling us about a particular man we've never met. But the Lord is showing us his sovereignty by fulfilling specific prophecy in Christ, by answering specific prayer through Christ, by bringing us the gospel, by feeding us spiritually through sent preachers. You can trust a God like this. He's going to take care of you. Well, how does Cornelius respond to the vision? He obeys immediately. Verse 7, he called two of his servants. Verse 8, he related everything to them and he sent them to Joppa. And then verse 9 will tell us, by the next day, they were already approaching the city. And that's where Peter, of course, is on the housetop about the sixth hour, which is noon. Now, what does that mean about the timing? Think of it. Joppa is about 30 miles from Caesarea. So even if you're traveling on horseback, you're talking about the edge of what a healthy horse could do in a day. So what, you might say? Well, Cornelius had a vision at 3 p.m. He told his guys about it. He sent them, and by noon the next day, they're almost there. What does that mean? It means they left as soon as possible, and they traveled with haste. We're not given the specifics, but what we know is Cornelius is devoted in obedience these are obviously unique circumstances. We don't have angels telling us to do specific things like build a boat in the middle of dry land or Joseph, you need to get out of Bethlehem and you need to take your wife and the child born with you. But we're seeing a principle, aren't we? Of heeding the Lord at once. Is that how we aim to live, brethren? As we hear God's word, as it rebukes and corrects us, do we give ourselves in obedience? Does his sovereignty drive our submission? Isn't that what Matthew 28 is saying? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Do what then? Go. I rule. Go. Are you obedient? Are we obedient to the sovereign great God? This is what marks Jesus' people. May it mark us. But then here, we turn to Peter. See, secondly, pushing back and pushing ahead. Verses 9 to 22. Pushing back and pushing ahead. Now, before the men from Cornelius arrive, Peter is on the housetop to pray at noon. That is the middle of the day, right? Peter, like Cornelius, has adopted, it seems, the traditional Jewish seasons of prayer, morning, noon, and night. David's pattern, Daniel's pattern. Now, you'll know that the Bible doesn't specifically command us to pray at these particular times, but certainly we can say as those devoted to the Lord, we have stated times of prayer. Now, it should strike you. This is a secondary point, but I think it's significant. It should strike you in a chapter loaded with the supernatural, with an angel speaking, with visions Peter's going to have from the Lord three times, that there is yet an emphasis on the ordinary means, preaching and prayer. How does God save his people? Through the preaching of the gospel. How do God's people live in fellowship with God? They pray. 
they are disciplined in their prayer lives. I know that prayer can become rote and you can have a heart that's cold to the Lord. But do you fight it knowing that could it be you have not because you ask not? Could it be that in all of our struggle to see missionaries sent out into the world, that the thing that we're not doing is praying to the Lord of the harvest, that he would send laborers? Praying that and praying that and praying that, and if we pastors model that before the people of God, that they would hear it and it would grip their soul, and that would be the means by which the Lord lays hold of a man and stirs him? Are we praying? Are we crying out to God? It's a pattern. Look at the devotion shown you in this chapter, both of Jew and of Gentile, and imitate it. Well, during Peter's prayer, he becomes hungry. It seems like a superfluous point. Okay, Peter wants to get a snack. He, he can't go to the fridge and get a snack. It has to be prepared. He has to wait. So while he's waiting, perhaps he goes back to prayer, but he falls into a trance. Verse 10. And interestingly, Peter's hunger is related to the vision. He sees, verse 11, the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending. And in the sheet are all kinds of animals, as in four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds. There are echoes here of days five and six of creation with a vast array of creatures in the sky and on the ground. And that echo signifies we're talking about animals without distinction to clean and unclean. And then in view of his hunger, Peter is told by the divine voice, verse 13, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, Peter recognizes he's being addressed by the divine voice. And yet Peter immediately pushes back. By no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is unclean or common. Have you noticed Peter has a pattern of telling the Lord that he's got it wrong? <laughs> Jesus starts talking about suffering. Peter says, far be it from you, Lord. Jesus speaks to the disciples of falling away. Peter says, even if they all do that, I'm not going to do that. Peter, or Jesus adds, even at this very night, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. What's Peter say? No way, not going to happen. You're wrong. This response is in the same spirit. It's unfiltered emotionalism. It's impulsiveness without thought. Get yourself together, Lord. No way I'm eating unclean stuff. Don't be ridiculous. Peter talks to the Lord as though the Lord has lost his mind. Now, it's never good to be telling King Jesus he, he's got it wrong. And we can sort of laugh at this. But on deeper reflection, this is serious. How could Peter be so brazen, so unthoughtful? Maybe some of us here who have foot and mouth disease can relate. Maybe you see yourself in Peter and you recognize that your first response is often poor and not a response of faith. In fact, there are times when we just don't like what the Lord says and we tell him he's got it wrong. We act as though perhaps his ethical boundaries are lines drawn in the wrong place. Maybe that's with sexual ethics. Jesus can't tell me who I can and can't desire. Or maybe it's the ethics of speech, like lying, acting as though the Lord's rules about bearing false witness only apply to you if your wife doesn't ask you a really hard question. Or maybe it's in matters pertaining to worship. Jesus should just accept whatever I choose to give him in worship because I'll do it my way. Or maybe it's further out, not just ethical boundaries, but a compulsion of the heart by the power of the Spirit that you're the one to go. But the Lord is pressing you. Now, that can't be the case. Something that struck me from the last session. Do you love Christ more than your comfort? Jesus, you have it wrong. I can't be uncomfortable. 
Brethren, we have to learn from Peter's repeated failures that we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak. We should learn to have a willingness to submit to the Lord, to shut our mouths and be shaped by the word of God. However, what should truly strike us here is that after Peter acts so foolishly, what happens? Verse 15, it should hit you across the face with striking force. And the voice came to him a second time. What grace. Isn't it reminiscent of Jonah chapter 3? The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Do you remember what happened the first time? Arise and go to Nineveh. Jonah goes the other way. He goes, interestingly, to Joppa, where Peter is, to catch a ship to Tarshish. And then there's a storm that the Lord hurls at him. And then there's a tossing overboard. Then there's the sinking. Then there's the fish swallowing. Then there's the prayer of Jonah from the belly of the sea monster. Then there's the vomiting up on land. And then comes again the gracious word. I haven't changed my mind, Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Look at the patience of our God to put up with his people and here to put up with Peter, to push aside his folly, to reveal the message again. This is a monumental change. The vision rocks Peter's world. He doesn't get it, but the Lord bears with Peter. But maybe another thing to see the Lord is also persistent, just like he was with Jonah, that the gospel, the truth, will go through the ordinary means to Gentiles. It will. Peter is told what God has made clean, do not call common. In other words, Peter, your judgment's off. You need to listen and consider matters in light of the new age, the messianic era, the arrival of the kingdom, the fullness of Christ. Get your mind, Peter, on God's interests and not your own understanding. Now, as to the content of the message, if all God's creatures are clean, that means here that old covenant designations of which food was a part, separating Jew and Gentile, have now ceased. It means, as Paul will say, the dividing wall of hostility has been abolished. The Jews, though willing to interact with Gentiles as long as it's on Jewish terms, they would never have table fellowship with a Gentile on Gentile turf. Who knows if the Gentile would do things in a kosher way. So it became a practice for the Jews, of course, to avoid the Gentiles. Peter is being redirected. What are the implications for gospel ministry to Gentiles. Well, the implications are going to create great controversy in Acts for the next several chapters, saying that Gentiles had to be circumcised to be saved, right? Is Christ plus circumcision? Peter is facing the same issue with food. Is the gospel Christ plus the dietary laws? Do Gentiles have to become Jews to get saved? No. That's the answer. Further, the vision means God has the right to determine what is clean. God has the right in this new gospel era to change the boundaries. The food laws were temporary. Now, even as this is being communicated a second time, Peter still doesn't get it. Before the sheet is taken up to heaven, we're told this happened three times. Interesting sets of threes with Peter, right? He's told things repeatedly. He, he doesn't seem to get it. The Lord is continuing to be patient with Peter, but Peter is persistent in pushing back. In fact, in verse 17, we're told that Peter is still inwardly perplexed. Now, friends, a threefold repetition says at least two things. The thing is fixed. The distinction Peter has lived with his whole life is now over. And it says, secondly, the Lord is asserting his authority repeatedly so that no man can think he can contradict the declaration. 
God dictates the terms. God is in charge. Man cannot define what is clean and unclean. Well, Peter's standing there perplexed, but he's pondering the matter at just the right time. For we're told, behold, verse 17, as the vision ends, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having found the right house, stood at the gate. And then Peter gets a push. Verse 19, while Peter was pondering, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation. Do you notice the Lord having to tell Peter that? You've hesitated enough. Without hesitation, for I have sent them. Peter's been resisting, but now the Spirit constrains him, pushes him. Similar to what he did with Jonah. To see that the Lord is governing the situation. And finally, Peter accepts the message. He goes down to the men. He asks, why are you looking for me? They highlight Cornelius' God-fearing heart. The fact that a holy angel had appeared to him to direct them to Peter. But the most important of all, and it's the first time we hear this. These guys say, the angel told Cornelius to get you, Peter, that you would come, into verse 22, that we would hear what you have to say. Peter, what do you have to say? You have a message given by Jesus Christ to communicate the grace of God. You are a witness of the death and resurrection of Jesus, and you have been gifted a treasure. It's been entrusted to you, and that message must be proclaimed. You must call all men to repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus is telling Peter the gospel is for these unclean people. They can be fellow members of the household of God. Peter, I'm sending you. Well, this is the moment of truth. Will Peter see that the Lord Jesus is blowing up his prior categories? Will he receive these men? Verse 23. And again, we're not Jews. Maybe we don't recognize the significance of this. But it should strike you. What did he do? He invited them to be his guests. What's the lesson? There are no barriers to keep people from the gospel. It's not that we cease to be a people with distinction. We are either Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. But those distinctions will not prevent fellowship in Christ. We share one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The church is unlike any other community in the world. Those apparently having nothing in common, united in Christ. What a beautiful thing. When I was on the way up here before I came, I I did that thing some of us do before you travel. You you get your car washed. And as I got in line to get the car washed, there's a special line for those who are members of the car wash. Can you be a member of a car wash? You can. You can. And I didn't get in the line. I'm on the way up here. There's a special lane as you're coming out of Atlanta, which only the Peach Pass people can drive. There's a special place to be where you can go faster than everyone else. There's not a special membership card or a special lane you need to get in. Some special thing you got to do, hoops you got to jump through. In order to receive the gospel of Jesus, you look on Christ, you repent and believe. That's it. We Gentiles should jump for joy as we're reading this passage. We don't have to obey all the ceremonial laws, the fasts, the feasts, the provisions about hair at our temples, not eating bacon. Christ abolished these barriers and we are free To go to Jesus from radically different backgrounds and we can have unity in the gospel by the grace of God. And then strikingly, how is the unity seen here? Was first seen in hospitality. Peter welcomes them as guests. That our, our unity is not theoretical. It is practical. One of the most glorious things about being a Christian is when you can go to the other side of the world and meet people you've never known before. And you can talk to them as if they're your best friend. That you're one with them. And it resonates in your soul. We have an intimate fellowship together in Christ. As Christ has welcomed us, we welcome one another. 
So, beloved, amidst all of our differences, do we rejoice in the true fellowship we have in the Lord, and do we seek fellowship with one another? Do we want more people brought into that glorious fellowship of union together in Jesus Christ? And then finally, see, expectation and excitement, verses 23 to 29. Peter's mind, no doubt, is reeling. It's one thing to believe the gospel can go to these dogs. It's another to welcome them as friends and to host them. And then Peter, recognizing the Spirit is working, that Christ is calling him to go, verse 23, the next day, rose and went. Now, notice, and this will be important later, Peter doesn't go alone. Some other brothers from Joppa accompanied him. In God's providence, these brothers from Joppa, fellow Jewish Christians, Acts 11 will tell us there were six of them, they will be a witness of everything that occurs. It's as though the Lord is saying, I know every matter is established on, two, on the testimony of two or three witnesses, but let me make sure we have seven here, Peter plus the other six. Peter is going to take some heat that he dared to eat with Gentiles. It was unthinkable to a first century Jew. But these men will be able to confirm, Peter hasn't gone rogue. He's obeying the Lord. The Spirit is owning this. The Spirit is driving this. The Spirit will soon fall on the Gentiles. God does things contrary to our expectations, doesn't he? The Lord shatters what we think is wise, what we erect as tradition. Our God will never be constrained by man's customs as though the gospel will be limited to those like us. The Lord rules all by his grand decree, which has always envisioned the nations serving him. The Jews knew this in the promise given to Abram. In you, Abram, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And yet the Jews, while they should have had great expectations of the great work God would do on, on the nations, they didn't. The Old Testament was clear, but their expectations weren't shaped by the word. Brethren, does this happen to us too? We could think of it maybe with respect to trials. We know we live in a fallen world. We know troubles are frequent. And yet as believers, what expectation do we often have? Clear sailing to glory. A race with no obstacles. Peter confronts us, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when, not if, when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Our God dashes our misguided expectations and he reshapes them by his word. Are our expectations being shaped by the word with respect to missions? Maybe we can think of an example of this in Luke's context. We could look back at Acts chapter 8 with that hate-spewing man ravaging the church, hard-hearted, casting his vote against believers to see them condemned and put to death. And we could think of that man, Saul of Tarsus, and we could think, no way that guy could get converted. But what does God do? He melts the hardest heart. We ought to have great expectations of his saving power. Jesus is causing his gospel to go forth and he will reign over every nation, tongue, tribe, and people. So what should our expectation be? That we send missionaries and people are going to get converted. Are we thinking like that? Or is it just too hard? The Lord regularly does things that are exceedingly abundantly beyond all we could ask or even think. Do we trust him? Perhaps, brethren, our God is too small. We pride ourselves at times as Reformed Presbyterians that our God is big. Do we function like that? The text is saying that our God is bigger than we could ever conceive. 
But then I want you to notice the expectancy, not only that we should have of a great God and him reshaping our expectations, see the expectancy in Cornelius. When Peter arrives, we read verse 24 that Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Now, Cornelius doesn't know all that Peter's going to say, but if an angel appeared to him to go get Peter and listen to Peter, then what Peter is saying must be vital. So Cornelius expects that God is about to give a great blessing. Saving mercies are going to fall. I must need this word. And he doesn't just see that. He needs it. Cornelius' expectation spills over to gathering his relatives and close friends. He's using his sphere of influence to gather people to hear a word from God. What a model that should be to us. It's reminiscent, isn't it, of Jesus sending the former demoniac to go tell his friends and his family what the Lord has done for him. Only here, Cornelius has a sense that God is going to meet with us. And if the Lord is stooping to meet with us, don't you want to be there? If you know you're about to get a message from God Almighty, a message of salvation, wouldn't you want to gather everyone to hear? It reminds me of a story of George Whitfield. He, he was coming to town. Whitfield, as you know, was a powerful preacher unfolding the riches of Christ, challenging sinners, moving minds and melting hearts. And there was great excitement to hear him when he arrived. Folks would hear he's coming and they would drop everything and go to the spot. And there's a story of a particular farmer, Nathan Cole. This is Connecticut, 1741. He heard that Whitfield was going to preach at a certain place at 11 a.m. Now Cole was an hour away if he rode by blazing horse to that spot. But when he heard at 10 a.m., he was in the field. What did he do? He dropped everything in the field. He ran home. He got his wife. And the two of them set off 12 miles by horseback to the place. Nathan would drive the horse till it was out of breath and then get off and run, telling his wife, don't slow down for me. And then when he couldn't run anymore, he would get back on the horse. As he approached the town, he heard rumblings of thunder, or so he thought. It was hundreds of horses. Massive clouds of dust are rising up on the horizon. And Nathan and his wife, as they arrive, they see nearly 4,000 people gathered to hear a preaching, the preaching of Christ for the saving of sinners. Oh, that we could gather that kind of excitement for gospel preaching. Or Cornelius' excitement. Uh, we would tell everybody, come and hear a word about Christ. Come and hear the blessings of God. Come and meet with the Lord. Come and learn of him. Because there's no God like our God. And his mercies are great. And yet the excitement soon spills over into what we might call excessive enthusiasm and misappropriated honor. Verse 25, Peter enters, Cornelius met him, he fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Now immediately you should ask, what is he doing? He's a God-fearer, right? He knows the Shema, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He knows there's one God and that one God demands unencumbered loyalty. And you're called to love him with everything that you are. Love this one God, worship him alone, exclusively love him wholly and intensely. Why in the world is he giving Peter Worship. I thought the angel said that Cornelius' life rose like a memorial to God. That he was a faithful man. This isn't faithful. Well, the sin of Cornelius here doesn't erase the truth about what he is. The Lord, thankfully, doesn't just see our glimpse of stupidity, the flash of sin that we all show. He sees what we are within. He searches our hearts and sees our love to him amidst inconsistency. Isn't that what Peter himself banked on? The third question comes to him, do you love me? Do you remember what Peter said? He didn't just say, I love you. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. 
you see the truth about who I am. That's what he sees in Cornelius. I don't know what's going on in Cornelius' mind. Is he in, infected with some Gentile view of, of uh, a heavenly man? I, I have no idea. But what's interesting in the text is Peter doesn't just walk away. The Lord doesn't tell Peter, well, forget the whole thing now. I can't believe he did that. I thought he was ready to receive the gospel, but never mind, go somewhere else. No, just as the Lord was patient with Peter, the Lord is patient with Cornelius. He's a devout man, but he's a sinner and he needs the gospel. He needs instruction in who Messiah is. He needs a teacher. And that's exactly what the Lord is going to give him. Maybe we've never been tempted to bow down and worship a preacher. But are idols not still encroaching on all of our hearts? Do we give in proper honor to mere men or things or possessions? We need our idolatry, any false thinking, driven out by the truth. And that's what happens here with Peter. Peter picks up Cornelius and says, stand up. I, too, am a man. Now, maybe this rebuke tells us something about Peter. While men in this world crave adulation, Roman emperors thinking they're gods or modern-day athletes, celebrities and musicians talking as though they're gods with their notoriety, their sports records that no one will ever beat, or their songs will give them immortality. Mere men frequently lift themselves up and claim the honor that belongs only to God. Peter won't have it. I'm just a man. I carry a gospel treasure in this jar of clay. I'm a lowly servant. It's reminiscent of John the baptizer speaking of Jesus. There's one coming, and I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie his sandal strap. Or later, he must increase, and I must decrease. Jesus is the focus. Cornelius, I'm just a man. Sometimes we gospel preachers need to remember that we are just men. Finite, fickle creatures with no divine power. Peter will not exalt himself. He will exalt the Savior. Remember how Paul will put this? We preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, and ourselves as bondservants for your sake, for the sake of the people. And then notice another crucial word in Peter's short speech. Stand up. I, too, emphatic in the original, I, too, myself am a man. Peter is saying to Cornelius, I'm a mere human, just like you. That seems very straightforward, doesn't it? But he's speaking to a Gentile. To a guy, however respected by the Jewish community for his alms, he's still regarded as a less than, as a dog. Gentiles were viewed by Jews as though they were the scum of the earth, filthy, vile, but whatever his views were before, whatever superiority Peter had in his mind or would have culturally felt, Peter dismisses it. And he tells this Gentile acting like a fool, I too am a man just like you. You see what Peter's doing? He's putting himself on the same level before God as this Gentile. That's another evidence of Peter's humility and Peter's change in perspective. In fact, right after Peter goes inside with these folks gathered, he immediately relates to them that he's also been rebuked. Is that the way that you meet people? <laughs> I've come to rebuke you, but let me tell you the Lord rebuked me first. The Lord has corrected his thinking, and he's honest about it. Verse 28, you yourselves know how unlawful, that is, it breaks Jewish tradition, for a Jew to associate with or visit with anyone of another nation. The Jews would have never shared a home with a Gentile. Even the Jews at synagogue, while appreciating that Cornelius gave money, they would have never invited him over, tried to understand his needs, listened to the holes in his theology. They wouldn't engage him. Peter does as a Jew, and he's willing to be under the same roof. Why? Verse 28, 
But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. God has taught me that all people, whether Jew or Gentile, whether believer or unbeliever, all people are image bearers. All people need the gospel. All people should be treated as those for whom the Lord cares. All people should be given the truth that they might repent and believe the gospel. Is there another subtle echo of Jonah here? The guy who so hated the Ninevites that he ran from the Lord when commanded to preach to them. And when Jonah, Jonah finally did preach to them and they repented, what did Jonah do? He got mad about it. I knew you were a good and gracious God, that you were merciful, that you abound in steadfast love. I wanted them to be zapped as less than human. And the Lord says, shouldn't I care about these people who don't know their right hand from their left and remember the cattle? <laughs> Jonah never seemed to get it. Peter gets it. He's going to stumble more, but he's getting it. He's not under Cornelius' roof in anger. He's recognizing, I too am a man. I'm like you. There are no common, unclean people. The saving riches of Jesus Christ are not locked up for only one group. Jesus is the Lord of all. Now, Jesus is going to come back. I mean, Peter's going to come back to that theme in the sermon, which we'll see tomorrow. But already he's highlighting the rule of King Jesus over all people and the need for all humanity to hear the message of salvation. For even the Samaritans understood in the early days of Jesus' ministry, John 4. He is the Savior of the world. Brethren, this has massive implications for world missions. If what Peter has learned is right, then our God would never have us pass over people as beneath us and neglect them. God would never have us stay in our little familiar circles and only speak of Christ to them. It is rather, go. Don't neglect them, even if they have strange customs, like the cannibals. John G. Payton pursued for the glory of Christ in the South Pacific. Or if they hold to strange ideas about a divine spirit in all things, and so they eat the hearts of the creatures they hunt, like the Native Americans whom David Brainerd pursued with the gospel. Peyton and Brainerd, to the eyes of men, were more civilized, less brutal, and so forth, than these uncultured pagans. But Peyton and Brainerd were willing to go into these dens of darkness because there were people there who needed to hear the gospel light and receive it because they were human too. They are lost, but they're not unsavable. They're deluded by the devil, but they are still objects of mercy. And these missionaries believed, I am no better than them. I'm just a man saved by grace. And they need someone to tell them of Christ because they as men stand in need of the one who can save. Is this what we think? Do we look around our communities and do we see people who don't look like us? Maybe they have lots of piercings or tats. Maybe they have strange hair colors and mutilated ears. Maybe they're people indulging gender fluid concepts in their dress. Maybe they simply have different accents or different skin colors. Do we see them and think they are unclean? Or do we see them as image bearers? People with souls who will perish in hell unless the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ are set before them that they would believe. They are people who share our humanity. And there's only one Savior among men, and it's Jesus Christ. If we see 
I've been saved from the ruin of my sin. I've been saved from my ugly past. Then God can save that person too. Do we say, Lord, then send me. Peter is learning of the mercy of Christ to all. He's recognizing I need to change my outlook. And I need to willingly carry the gospel of Christ to those with whom I would ordinarily never associate. Do we have that perspective? Is the love of Christ and the glory of his salvation compelling us to go that we would see others' souls saved to the honor of Jesus? How does Jesus save his people? Through a preacher sent. Is he sending me? Let's pray together. O oh Lord our God, we come and we marvel at this text for so many reasons. We marvel at your sovereign plan of salvation. We marvel at your patience with sinners. We marvel, O oh Lord, at the way that you send men to other men that we, frail creatures of the dust, could be rescued from the ruin of our depravity and united to Christ and made alive with him. Lord, I pray that you would cause souls even in this room to recognize that I, too, am a man. And there are people perishing, people like me, and I need to carry the gospel to them. Lord, would you give us faithfulness in proclaiming that wondrous gospel of Christ because we are privileged to carry it in this jar of clay. Hear us as we pray these things, for we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, if you'll take your booklet once more and you'll find there uh, Psalm 22b, all you that fear Jehovah's name, we're going to stand together and sing this psalm of praise which envisions the risen Christ calling the nations to him. Let's praise God together.
Well, we're all now dismissed. Uh, the dinner will begin at 5 p.m. and it's uh, straight back, I believe. The fellowship hall is back there. And then uh, we will commence again this evening at 7 p.m. So we look forward to seeing you then and uh, pray that you have a blessed fellowship around the tables together.
Good evening, everyone. It's about time to get started, so if you could please find your seat. If you could please grab your seat, we're about to get started. And I just have a couple of small housekeeping items as you get seated and as we prepare for our evening session. As per our normal tradition, we will have our men's fellowship at Boda's tomorrow evening. If you have any specific questions about how to get there, please find Dr. Pipa. He would be happy to fill you in. And he's very good with Google Maps. You should see him with Google Maps. Apple Maps, not so much. But please see Dr. Pipa for more details for our men's fellowship tomorrow evening. Uh, also, if you have any questions for, uh, for Q&A sessions that are coming up tomorrow afternoon or any conference feedback, you'll see that at the back of your program, you can use a QR code. If you don't know how to use that, please see Dr. Pipa. <laughs> He'll be glad to help you. Uh, use your smartphones. And you can use the feedback there for our Q&As and also just to help us continue to improve here at, uh, at our spring conference. I'd also like to just take a quick opportunity to thank our friends at Heritage Bible Church who have been so gracious to us in allowing us to use their building. Uh, somebody asked us, how much are they charging you to use this building? And they're not charging us anything. They're just friends uh, in the ministry, very gracious, and we thank, we're so thankful for their friendship and letting us use their church. And to be good uh, guests in their church, I'd encourage you not to bring any coffee into uh, the sanctuary. So please keep coffee in the fellowship hall. That's all the announcements for this evening. Thank you. Well, in just a moment, I'm going to introduce our speaker this evening, although he's well known to all of you who will be here. But before I do that, I have a special announcement. And so I'd like to ask Dr. Curdo to come forward. I don't see exactly where he is, but I know he's here. Ah, there he is. Yes. Come on forward, uh, Tony. Uh, many of you will know this, but, but I, I, I don't know if all of you do. Um, Dr. Curdo, who has labored so diligently in our midst for so many years, and just made a really, I think, an incalculable impact on uh, generations of students, really, at Greenville Seminary, is his, he's now moving to Switzerland. He's moved to Switzerland. He's on sabbatical this semester, and he's going to be based there moving forward. So this is the last year of him being a full-time professor at Greenville Seminary. He's still going to come back and teach a module for us, and we're grateful for his willingness to do that. But the Lord has opened some incredible doors for him to uh, engage in church planting work in Europe and to come alongside existing churches and strengthen them. So we wanted to take an opportunity publicly to thank Dr. Curdo, and really, as we know, to thank the Lord for Dr. Curdo and for his ministry as just a very, very small token. Any of you who know Dr. Curdo will know that I, I think it, it's fair to say your favorite Puritan book is The Shorter Catechism Explained from Scripture by Thomas Vincent. And so we were able to find him in 1837, Edinburgh edition of that, which is the one that the Banner of Truth uh, edition is taken from. So Dr. Curdo, this is from us, and we love you, we're grateful for you, and uh, we, we, we want to honor you in a public way while we thank God for your service. Now, I have another great joy tonight, which is to give a brief introduction for my friend and colleague in the ministry of Greenville Seminary, uh, Michael Morales. Many of you will know him. Many of you have been in his classes or his Sunday school class at Woodruff Road PCA. He's an ordained teaching elder in the PCA. And he's written, of course, a number of books that I know have been helpful to many in this room, and there are more to come. There are two big books that we think are going to come this spring, and, and many are looking forward to that. But, but more than that, of course, a scholar of the, uh, of the highest level, um, but, but really a, a humble student of Scripture and, and a man that I can, and, and all of us as his colleagues, can without any question, point students to and say, follow his example as he follows the example of Jesus Christ. So it's, it's a real honor to be uh, associated with all the men on the faculty at Greenville Seminary. I really do consider it a great honor, and, and it's a special honor to introduce uh, my friend, Dr. Morales, this evening, who will be addressing us uh, from the Old Testament.
Now, before he does that, I want us to stand and we're going to sing Psalm 98a. Again, this will be right next to the notes section uh, for session three. Psalm 98a, oh, sing a new song to the Lord. Let's raise our voices in praise to God.
pray together. Oh God, you are the judge of all the earth, our creator and redeemer. We thank you for gathering us here in this place that we might hear from you. We thank you for giving us the gift of your word, which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We ask that you might instruct us from your word, that you might teach us, that you might, might guide us in the paths of truth. Father, we look forward to the day of your son's return, but we pray that as we await that day, we might humbly seek you, we might tremble at your word, and we might never cease to give voice to the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, enliven our hearts this evening by your Holy Spirit as we open your word, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. It's our custom to take an offering during the evening sessions, and so the ushers will come forward to do that, and as they are passing the plate, we'll sing together while seated the next hymn in your uh, program, When Morning Gilds the Skies. turn with me to 
Genesis chapter 37, and I'll be reading uh, verses 1 through 11. Genesis chapter 37. Hear the word of the Lord. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with the sons of Bilchah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, look, I have dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you will send the Spirit and be with us tonight and by your word and spirit, renew our vision of the exalted Lord Jesus Christ. And seeing him, may our hearts be set aflame by your Holy Spirit, aflame both for him and for his great commission. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. If I were to ask each one of you, what scripture passage comes to mind when you hear the word mission, undoubtedly, the majority of you would say the Great Commission, Matthew 28, and rightly so. And we've been well edified and inspired, and this is clearly a key text when Christ sends forth his apostles. Uh, In addition to that, my purpose this evening is to show you that the book of Genesis really is the basis and even the anticipation for the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Ancient Israel's theology of missions was the book of Genesis. Genesis unfolds the glory of God and his zeal to reclaim the nations, all humanity to himself for a life of blessedness and fullness in his presence. In Genesis, we can, I think, readily see provided Israel with the historical context and the spiritual foundation for Israel's vocation among the nations. But I want to urge something beyond that, more than just a foundation. Genesis formed uh, by its very genre, I would urge. The book's intended function and purpose within the life of Israel was to serve as the charter for Israel's mission. Now, since Genesis is a rather large book uh, to survey, uh, we are simply going to look at the culminating final story of Genesis where a lot of this theology comes together. Our focus will be on the story of Joseph. But for the sake of context, I'll offer a brief review walking us through the different sections of Genesis. And what I think we'll find is that every section fills in another piece of the theological puzzle. And when put together, the book of Genesis 
served as something of a map, a blueprint for Israel of God's mission to the world. And so beginning with Genesis 1 through 11, the first major section, Genesis 1 through 11 narrates the miserable plight of the nations. The nations are under the power of sin and death. They have been judged by God, scattered from his presence, the Tower of Babel. And so these chapters set the context for Israel's mission. All humanity is in a state of sin and misery. This sets the context for the mission of Israel. It answers the question, why? Why does Israel need to be sent on mission? Because this is the plight of the world and this is the plight of the nations. They are in spiritual exile from God. And so the why of the mission uh, we are given in Genesis 1 through 11. And that leaves us with the patriarchal stories. Uh, in a way, the patriarchal narratives uh, give us the nature of Israel's mission to the nations. The ancient rabbis had a saying, whatever happened to the patriarchs is a sign for their children. And what they mean by that is that what we find in the lives of the patriarchs are a preview, a foreshadowing of what will take place in the life of Israel in the future. And so let's think about uh, these three patriarchal stories. The first one, the Abraham story, Genesis 12 through 22. Here, God clearly unfolds his plan to restore the missions, or excuse me, the nations to fellowship with himself. He calls out Abraham, promising that through his seed, through Israel, he will bring blessing back to the nations by bringing the nations back to a knowledge of himself. And so in addition to knowing and loving God, in addition to being his treasured possession, this is Israel's reason for existence, to bring a light of the knowledge of God to the nations, to restore blessing to the nations, and so we can say that the Abraham narrative answers the question what of God's mission, supplying its goal. And then we come to the Jacob narrative, Genesis 25 through 35, and here God teaches Israel through their namesake about their election to serve this mission, Israel's election to worship and serve the Lord God, to be his people, to serve him, and to be used of him for the nations is utterly by grace, not by merit or works. And so the Jacob story answers the question, who of the mission? In terms of Israel's election to serve God, to be his people on mission. And then that brings us finally to Genesis 37 through 50. Uh, what piece of the puzzle is supplied by this story? How does the story of Joseph fit into the theology of Israel's mission? Well, I would urge that this novella supplies the answer to the question, how? How will the Lord restore blessing to the nations through Abraham's seed, through Israel? And the answer is that God will raise up an Israelite ruler to bless his people and the world. Missions, as we'll see, flows from kingship and the story of Joseph is all about kingship, first and foremost, from beginning to end, as we'll see, kingship. And again, mission flows from kingship. It is under the authority of Christ's kingship that the church goes forth. And really, uh, if we wanted to do this properly and we had more time, we would begin all the way in Genesis because the Great Commission begins with the kingship and commission of Adam in Eden. Uh, we don't have time to pursue that idea, but the reality is that Adam's failure is what has led to the need for Israel's mission and God's determination to raise up an Israelite ruler to bring blessing to his people and the world. And so my aim tonight is to show you that Genesis 37 through 50 sets forth the divine pattern and the divine promise of kingship for Israel's mission to the world. And so let's begin first with Joseph, the divine pattern of kingship. And thankfully, since most of us are familiar with the Joseph story, I'm going to briefly summarize uh, and, and offer, do it by way of giving you some literary features that enable us to sort of rehearse 
the story bringing out its pattern of kingship, which is suffering and exaltation. So there's three literary features that I want to point out. The first is the motif of garments. And what we find is that a change in garments leads to a change in the plight of Joseph. And this happens from the very beginning, goes all the way up into the end. So as you recall, the story begins even as we've read that Jacob gives Joseph a garment, a special tunic. And that tunic signifies that he is the beloved son of Jacob, the firstborn of his beloved wife, Rachel. And it signifies leadership. Uh, Jacob uh, gives him not only this tunic designating leadership, but then uh, he uses Joseph in the life of his brothers as a leader among his brothers. And of course, his brothers despise him. Will you indeed reign over us, they spew out. Will you really have dominion over us? And so we find that terrible incident where the brothers strip him of his coat, led by Judah, the natural leader of the family, as we'll see. They strip him of his coat. They put him in a pit. Eventually, they will sell him to Midianite caravan on their way to uh, the land of Egypt. But they take his coat. They shred it. They slaughter a goat, dip the coat in the goat's blood, and they bring it before their father, and they say, recognize, please, is this your son Joseph's coat? Plunging their father into unconsolable misery and grief. And so they strip him of his coat, and we find he ends up cast into a pit. Well, later, when he is in Egypt, uh, we find that Joseph had been given another coat, uh, a tunic in Potiphar's house. And when he runs away from uh, Potiphar's wife, she clutches at him and keeps his garment in her hand. And we know immediately that Joseph's plight is about to change and he ends up being put in a dungeon. And in the Hebrew Bible, that dungeon is called a pit. So once again, we see that a garment is removed and Joseph for the second time ends up in a pit. Well, when he's finally delivered from the prison house, we read about him changing his clothes, shaving, and then he's brought before the presence of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh grants him a royal garment signifying his new authority and his exaltation to be a ruler. And so by tracking this garment motif, we, we, we track a variety of descents and ascents in the life of Joseph that um, flow through one major descent and ascent in his life suffering and exaltation. Another literary feature to keep in mind through this story is the key word, hand. And only our most literal translations will catch all the nuances of the way that, that hand uh, is used. Often uh, words will be switched. Uh, the notion of hand in uh, the Joseph story signifies primarily authority. So in Genesis 39, we read that the Lord prospered everything in the hand of Joseph. And this leads to Potiphar putting everything that he has into the hand of Joseph. And then as I had just mentioned, when uh, Joseph is escaping from Potiphar's wife, she clutches at him and his garment remains in her hand. So we see the two motifs of the garment and the keyword hand coming together to signify the great loss of authority and position in Joseph's life. And then later when he becomes ruler, the two motifs come together again. The Pharaoh takes his signet ring off and puts it literally on the hand of Joseph and clothes him with royal garments in a gold chain around his neck, transferring authority and glory to Joseph. And then the final literary feature, I would point out a familiar one, is dreams that come in pairs. This happens three times in the story and what the function of the dreams is in the narrative itself is they propel the story forward. So the story as we've read begins with Joseph having a pair of dreams that he is going to become a ruler that his own family will bow down before him. You recall the second pair of dreams is when he's in the dungeon, the dream of the baker and the butler. And I always want to say the candlestick maker as well, but. <laughs> That would take us to Exodus in the tabernacle, and we're just trying to cover Genesis um, tonight. And then there's the pair of dreams from 
Pharaoh himself. And what we find is that the pair of dreams and the way people respond to them are used providentially by God to finally exalt Joseph as ruler. And the other scenario, the other fact about these pair of dreams as Joseph himself reveals to Pharaoh is that the fact that the the dreams come in pairs confirms that this is God's determined will. And that last point is really crucial when we analyze the character of Joseph because so often Joseph gets negative press. Uh, We hear about it all the time, that he was a spoiled brat as a child, his father doted on him overly much, and so he uh, very unwisely, foolishly uh, revealed his dreams of grandeur to his brothers. Our friends, nothing could be further from the truth. On the contrary, not not only did Jacob uh, set apart Joseph for authority, but God has done so as well. And these dreams are prophetic visions of God. You know, before the canon is complete, God speaks. He communicates through dreams and visions. Joseph is functioning as a prophet. He is obligated the burden of the Lord. The lion is roared. Who will not speak? He's obligated to give the word of the Lord to the people of God, his own family, the covenant community. And so Joseph, far from being a spoiled brat, we we, we never see God dealing with him and, and him. We know he was a sinner, but this is not what the story is bringing out. He's righteous. He's even killed. He's Uh, He never grasped for anything. He's the opposite of his father Jacob in his early days. Uh, The story of Joseph is is Joseph, far from grasping, is suffering patiently, waiting for the confirmed will of God to come true. Even though all the earth conspires against him, he waits and abides for the word of God to come true. And so this is the divine pattern of kingship. A righteous Israelite suffers and then is exalted as orchestrated by God, exalted to rule, rejected by his brothers, mistreated in exile. Joseph descends to this spiritual Sheol, Egypt. But then by the hand of God, he is exalted and elevated to where he becomes, in his own words, a father to Pharaoh. And he becomes ruler over all the land of Egypt. With Pharaoh's signet ring on his hand, the gold chain on his neck, the royal robes around him, he rides in a chariot while servants call out, bow the knee, exalted by God. But now we need to ask why. Why has God determined in his providence to exalt Joseph to this position of royalty? How does it function within the story? And what we find in the story is that by God's plan, Joseph has been exalted to save, to save his family and to save the world. His reign is characterized by the spirit of God, by the wisdom of God, through which he supplies bread for the life of the world, saving many people alive in what is called a great deliverance. And so, friends, this is how the singular seed of Abraham would channel all the blessings and promises to Abraham for the sake of the world, for the nations, and even the people of God themselves. This is the pattern when a righteous Israelite suffers and then is exalted by God, exalted to save, then the nations will be glad, the nations will be restored to him. Now then, I'm calling this a pattern, a divine pattern of kingship. If the Joseph story, as I'm reading it, presents us with a divine pattern of kingship for the sake of Israel's mission, then we would expect what I would call a canonical awareness that this is indeed the function not only of Genesis, but of the Joseph story. In other words, we would expect that the figure of Joseph uh, functions similarly in Israel's later history and scriptures, that this pattern would have been known in such is indeed the case. Uh, We could go on and on on this point for the sake of time. I'll give just a few examples. Think of Moses. You just flip a few pages. The next great deliverer, the deliverer of the Old Testament. Think about how Moses is portrayed as another Joseph. 
He is elevated within Pharaoh's royal house. Like Joseph, his brothers rage against him. Will you indeed, who set you up to be ruler and judge over us, they say to Moses. Like Joseph, he marries the daughter of a priest, has two sons, and he names them uh, according to his experience of exile. And we could go on. Both Joseph and Moses are mistaken for Egyptians. Clearly, the great deliverer, the, the great um, deliverer who becomes a pattern himself for the Messiah is written uh, with the brushstrokes of Joseph himself. Uh, we could go on and talk about the many parallels between the life of David and Joseph, how David, like Joseph, was sent to check on his brothers and many more. Uh, but skipping all of that, let me say broadly, with uh, the next section of scripture after the Torah, jo Joshua through Kings, a section of scripture that essentially amounts to a theology of Israelite kingship, Notice how it begins with Joshua. Uh, Joshua, who is a descendant of Joseph, who in many ways is the ideal king. He lives 110 years like Joseph does. When Joshua dies, Joseph's bones are buried. It's the end, the last chapter of Joshua. And, and again, I've mentioned David, but let me skip to the very end of this theology of kings, this history of kings. Think about how 2 Kings ends. The southern kingdom judged by God through the Babylonians, uh, are wiped out. The temple, the city of God is destroyed in rubble and ruins, the smoke ascending into heaven. So many of the exiles are carted off into Babylon. Uh, it is a miserable story. And yet the author gives us one last paragraph, an epilogue. And in that epilogue, the, 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 the camera zooms in on Jehoiakim, the last king who is in exile in Babylon. And we read these words at the end of 2 Kings. The king of Babylon lifted up the head of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from the prison house and spoke kindly to him and set his throne above the throne of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim removed his prison garments and ate bread continually in the presence, in his presence all the days of his life. Now significantly, many have found echoes here of the Joseph story. But the question is, why? At the end of the story of the kings of Israel, do we get this slight echo of the Joseph story? What happened to the patriarchs is a sign to their children. This dismal story closes by tracing ever so lightly the pattern of the story of Joseph, reminding us that God's mission is still on. And that one day this divine pattern will be fulfilled by the Messiah who will suffer and then be exalted. And this, my friends, I say, is Israel's theology of missions. When the nations come under the scepter of the Israelite ruler whom God exalts after he has suffered, exalted to save, then the nations will be saved. Then the nations will be glad and rejoice in the blessings of God. So Joseph, the divine pattern of kingship, now we need to explore how Joseph's pattern of kingship gets prophesied and promised to Judah. And so secondly, we look at Judah, the divine promise of kingship. And as I survey through Judah's role in this story, I'm actually going to begin at the end, and then we'll work our way backward. The end of the story in Genesis 49, Jacob, you recall, gives prophetic blessings on his sons. And what we discover is that he prophesies that kingship will come and remain with the line of Judah. So in Genesis 49, verses 8 through 10, Jacob says, your father's children, Judah, will bow down to you. Oh, but this sounds just like Joseph's dream, which has already been fulfilled. And he goes on. Jacob says, the scepter will not depart from Judah. And he goes on and he says to him, to Judah, will be the obedience of the nations. Jacob is 
prophesying that this pattern of kingship that's been accomplished throughout this story is going to be fulfilled in an ultimate sense through Judah, through the line of Judah. He, he understands that the Messiah will descend from the line of Judah. And so God's promises to Abraham will be channeled to and through a Messiah who derives from the line of Judah. When he raises up an Israelite ruler to bring blessing to his people and to the nations, it will be an Israelite ruler who is a son of Judah. Now this theological trajectory whereby the promises of Abraham get channeled to and through the Messiah is actually given clearly in the Old Testament. One is what is one of the, the most glorious messianic passages in the Old Testament, and that is Psalm 72. Psalm 72 declares his dominion will be from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. All kings will bow down to him. All nations will serve him. But then we get the Abrahamic promises echoed as applied to this singular seed. In Psalm 72, verse 17, may his name endure forever. His name continue as long as the sun. May they be blessed in him, the Messiah, May all nations call him blessed. And in his stunning gospel, the apostle Paul proclaims the same theology of Israel's mission. In Romans 15, 12, he uh, quotes from Isaiah and he proclaims that a root of Jesse that is a son of Judah will rise to reign over the nations. In him, the nations will hope. This is the same theology of missions that we find in the book of Genesis. And so we see that the divine pattern of Joseph has been prophetically promised as kingship for Judah. But now the great question is why? Surely this is a confusing prophecy to us if we've read through this story. Judah the one who led his brothers in a treacherous act, both hateful to his own brother and mercilessly cruel to his own father. And then he abandons his family for a life among the Canaanites. Why is Judah, of all people, given the kingship? Why is it that his brothers will bow down to Judah? Why has God exalted Judah? Well, aside from the way that the story ends, another uh, signal in the story of Judah's prominence is in the literary structure. So Judah is given the central pivotal scene and given the longest speech in the story of Joseph, which is really the story of Joseph and Judah. And I'm speaking of chapter 44. This is the heart and center of the story. And in this story, Judah and Joseph are brought together, Joseph is in disguise, brought together on stage for a magnificent event. Judah here performs an act of redemption, an impassioned gesture of atonement that drives to the heart of God's mission to the world through kingship. Judah's act unveils the sort of ruler God desires and more, the sort of ruler God will raise up for his people and for the world. Well, let's begin with the context of Genesis 44. I meant to mention before, I'm flipping around from passages, don't feel the burden to do so. If you just listen intently, I'll try to summarize well. So in Genesis 44, in a ruse aimed at discerning their hearts, Joseph, again disguised as the vice regent of Egypt, he has ensured that his royal silver cup gets inserted into Benjamin's food sack when he sends him out. And you recall that Benjamin is now the new beloved son of Jacob, the only son left of his uh, deceased wife, Rachel. And so the brothers are tracked down by the forces in Egypt. They're returned. They're all arrested and brought back. And judgment comes for Benjamin. The cup of judgment is found in his sack. And so Benjamin is condemned for a life of bitter slavery in Egypt, precisely what had happened to Joseph. Now, if these brothers were the same sorry lot that they had been earlier, this would be a great occasion for joy. They would rejoice at this providence and so much the worse for their father. 
And yet what happens? Judah steps forward. Judah draws near to this Egyptian ruler, again, Joseph, and he delivers, again, the longest speech in Genesis, an impassioned speech, not only the longest, but the most rhetorically elegant and persuasive, full of emotion. And it's at this literary summit of the story that Judah offers himself in place of his brother Benjamin. Verse 33, he says, take me instead. Let the lad go. I will remain here in Egypt and I will be your slave. I will take that cup of judgment for myself. Please, he says, let your servant Judah remain here in Egypt as a servant to my Lord and let the lad ascend out of Egypt with his brothers. Judah puts himself in exchange for his brother even though this is the brother that his father so loves. You see, rather than envying Benjamin, he sacrifices himself for his brother. And friends, he's not play acting, he means it. He'll never see his father, never see his children, never see his home and his country again. He will lose himself willingly in bondage and slavery in Egypt. And this to preserve the brother that his father so loves. This for the sake of his father and his brothers. Now, if you recall, Judah had already told Jacob that he would stand as surety for his brother Benjamin. See, Jacob had said earlier on, we're running out of food, we're running out of bread, go to Egypt lest we die. And the brother said, we cannot go. They said, we cannot go back unless we have Benjamin with us and you won't let him go. This, by the way, is another sub-theme of the patriarchal narratives. Every last one of them needs to be able to sacrifice a beloved son. We know that Abraham was called to sacrifice his son Isaac, and here Benjamin is called for the sake of his family to sacrifice his beloved son Benjamin, and he can't do it. He won't do it. But then Judah arose, and he draws near to his father, and he says, I will be surety for Benjamin. He says, place, and watch for the key word, place the lad in my hand. And Jacob looks into his eyes, and he knows he means it. Now, parents are aware. Jacob is not naive. He, he knows the attitude his sons had to Joseph there's no way he can suspect something went on with his sons. And now is he supposed to give a Benjamin to these? But something in Jacob's voice, excuse me, in Judah's voice, something in his eyes, and Jacob knows this is real. And he releases his grip. He places Benjamin, his whole life and soul, into the hand of Judah. And now the time has come. Benjamin, the cup of judgment in his sack. Benjamin, condemned for a life of bitter slavery in Egypt to be exiled from his family. And Judah arises. He boldly approaches the Egyptian ruler. And he pleads ardently and persuasively with many words that this ruler will allow for Judah himself to take his brother's place. But oh friends, the, the, the beauty of the act of Judah is in his motive. He does this out of love for his father. In verses 30 and 31, he says, now therefore when I come to your servant, my father Jacob, and the lad is not with us, since Jacob's life is bound up with the lad's life, when he sees he's not with us, he'll die. And we will cause our father's head to descend into the grave. What selfless sympathy for his father. What's happened? Where is the jealous rivalry? Where's the contention among brothers? Where's the jealousy, the malicious talk, the scheming? It's all gone. And it breaks open the heart of Joseph. 
This is not only the central scene, it's the pivotal scene. After this, Joseph can't contain himself. He sends out his servants and he opens up with a great lament and weeping. And the story unravels from this literary summit in height. Judah's central act illustrates magnificently the Jewish notion of repair. That this idea of repair is when someone acts in such a way as to reverse and undo a previous evil act. And Jake, Judah's act here reverses his previous treachery in two ways. And the first, again, is in his motive. He wants to spare his father Jacob from grief, even though Jacob favors Benjamin. You see, before it was because Jacob favored Joseph that Judah envied him and led his brothers. He used all of his leadership gifts to lead them in this act of treachery without any concern for the sorrow of their father. Jacob's mourning over Joseph had been like a descent into the grave, and now Judah is saying, I want to keep him from descending into the grave because he loves Benjamin, because he loves Benjamin more than me, because it would be more bearable for him to lose me. Out of love for my dear father, let me take his place. And in a second way, I mean, this is a literal reverse. Rather than selling Rachel's son into Egyptian slavery, Judah offers himself literally into Egyptian slavery, exiling himself in this in order to deliver his brother out of Egypt. The act is a complete reversal of his former treachery. Judah's sacrificial act, this gesture of atonement then, is crowned by God with kingship in Genesis 49, as we've seen. This is why, O Judah, your brother shall bow down to you. This is why the nations will render obedience to you. This is why the scepter shall never depart from you, Judah, because you have become a sacrificial servant among your brothers. Now the question is, where did that come from? We've answered one question only to create another. What happened to this scoundrel Judah? When did God so deal with him? When did God so crush the scoundrel we had seen earlier to the point where this perfume, this fragrance of the Lord Jesus Christ himself pervades the very air of this scene that we can breathe in so deeply? And the answer to that question is all the way back in the beginning, Genesis 38. Now this chapter, and some of you parents who know what Genesis 38, I was tempted to take a poll, not of the pastors, but of your congregants here. How many of your pastors skipped this chapter in preaching through Genesis? This is a magnificent chapter. We need to see this not so much as a, an embarrassing blot in the life of a rogue, we need to see this chapter as God's merciful crushing of Judah so that he might become a royal son of God. Now, Genesis 38 opens in a very fascinating way. Uh, the opening words are, it came to pass at that time, that is after they sold Judah into, or Joseph into slavery, it came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers. And in the Hebrew, as I'll mention in a moment, um, this opening phrase aligns Judah with Joseph in a very close way. We're being told that this is a story of two brothers. This is the story of two journeys. Because Joseph, remember, descended into Egypt. Everyone always descends into Egypt because Egypt is like this uh, spiritual Sheol. And the actual Hebrew here doesn't say Joseph, uh, Judah departed. It says Judah descended away from his brothers. And so immediately, Judah's descent is in alignment with Joseph's descent. But then we also see that Joseph is separated from his brothers for life in Egypt. And here Judah separates himself from his brothers for life among the Canaanites. And so we should expect to see that Judah's journey takes place here as it does in this chapter, having sold his own brothers to strangers. 
think, think about that. He sold his own brother to strangers. And having heard the groans, the anguish of his father as wave upon wave of suffering and profound anguish struck and battered the heart of his father, Judah must surely have despised himself. We're not given an explanation, but we're told it was at that time Judah needs to leave. How could he bear to look at his father's withered, grief-battered soul day after day? He can't. He just leaves. He abandons the family, and he starts anew. The text flies through years, decades perhaps. We're told that Judah finds a wife, bears a son, then a second son, then a third son. Eventually, he takes a young woman, Tamar, as a wife for his first son, heir. But that's all background. Then the drama of the story really begins. The drama begins when Judah himself loses his firstborn son. As a judgment from God because of the wickedness of his son, we're told that God killed him. And suddenly Judah finds himself in his father's place, grieving over a firstborn son. Now it's Judah's turn to have his house visited by sorrow. And in desperation, Judah even tries to redeem his son from the grave. And he gets his second son, Onan, and he directs him to raise up an heir for his firstborn son through his widow, Tamar. See, in the ancient world, to have your line cut off, in fact, it's one of the great judgments of God is to be cut off. It doesn't just mean you die, but your whole line. To die without sons to carry on your name was a horrific, almost unthinkable thought. And Judah has this in mind. He doesn't want his firstborn son to be cut off. And so he commands his second son to raise up an heir for the first son. But we need to see here that Judah is trying to raise up his son, as it were, from the ashes of the judgment of God. Ah, but the second son says... Now I'm the firstborn. With selfishness in the extreme, the second son says to himself, all of the rights and the privileges of being the firstborn son have fallen upon me. And why shouldn't my father want them to pass on to me when our brother has providentially been struck down? How wicked. He will not raise up an heir for his brother for the sake of of status for the sake of privilege. This is Cain slaying Abel, and it's actually much worse because instead of refusing Tamar and just saying no to his father, he pretends obedience and treats Tamar like a harlot, denying her a son. So in righteous anger, God kills Judah's second son. Now, if the death of the firstborn son enabled Judah to experience profound grief in sympathy with Jacob, the wickedness and death of his second son held up a mirror to Judah himself and his own actions among his brothers. Now he can see through the eyes of a father, the heinousness of such a treacherous act against one's brother. He sees the wickedness of his own conduct against his brother Joseph. And Judah is helpless. He cannot force one brother to selflessly love and sacrifice himself for the sake of another brother. He cannot force one brother to love God and neighbor and to care more about his family than himself. Just as Judah sold Joseph into slavery, an inevitable death, so his second son, Onan, his second son, Onan, abandons his brother to extinction. Let his line be cut off. I'm the firstborn now. And God strikes him down. But you see, now Judah is left with one son, a beloved son, that he will not release his grip on. He will not send his third son to raise up an heir through Tamar for his firstborn son. 
and he lies to her. He says, remain in widowhood until this third son is, is old enough. But he will not do it. He will not sacrifice his beloved son. And so God has one more lesson for Judah. We read that his wife died. His two sons died, then his wife died. Did he mourn for her the way Jacob mourned for Rachel? We don't know, but we read that eventually he went to a shearing festival and had relations with a harlot, but it was actually Tamar sacrificing herself for her dead husband's line, for Judah's own line. And in the process, you recall, Judah had given her his staff, signet ring, and cord. These were markers of identity. Well, months go by. Later, it's reported to Judah that Tamar is pregnant through harlotry. Bring her out and let her be burned, he says, with unjustified, unrighteous indignation. But then is when it happens. This is when it finally happens. The moment of recognition for Judah, where all the pieces finally fall into place. You know, in Greek tragedies, the plot always builds to this moment called anagnoresis. It's the great, dreadful moment of recognition, like when King Oedipus realizes the bitter fulfillment of the very prophecy his house had sought to avoid. Well, Tamar sends the staff and the signet ring and the cord with a message. Recognize, please, the signet ring and its cord and the staff. She says, by the owner of these, I am with child. And in recognizing them, Judah finally recognizes himself. All of God's hammer blows to his soul lead to this last realization of Judah. She is more righteous than I, he declares publicly, for I had unjustly withheld my third son, Shelah, from her. But more deeply, that phrase, recognize, please, occurs only two times in the entire Bible, right here and in the previous chapter. When Judah led his brothers to take that blood-drenched coat of Joseph and they shoved it in the face of Jacob and said, recognize, please, is this your son Joseph's coat? so callously and now the words come back to Judah in this one final moment of recognition in this one last bitter lesson Judah is humbled and broken through the unfathomable and magisterial ways and workings of God through a Canaanite daughter who sacrificed herself for the sake of his son's line, his own line, Judah has both recognized the depths of his own miserable sinfulness, and he's confessed. Judah is ready now to rule. Broken Judah is made new. And friends, don't miss this. In literary brilliance, it's precisely at this moment that the staff and the signet ring come back to Judah. He's ready to be king. And these are signs of kingship. He's now ready to lay down his life for his brothers out of selfless love for his father. Just as with the divine pattern of kingship from Joseph, so also with the divine promise of kingship to Judah. Scripture everywhere upholds the prophetic promise the prophetic utterance of Jacob upon Judah in Genesis 49. And in, in, in this, I don't need to belabor. We're all so familiar. We could go to Numbers 24 and look at the third and fourth oracle of Balaam. Uh, we could go to 2 Samuel 7 and the Davidic covenant. We can go to so many of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Hosea, uh, Zechariah, Micah. All of these prophets proclaim that salvation will come when God raises up that Israelite ruler who descends from Judah, who is a son of David. And this becomes the great hope for Israel itself. The mission through Israel that gets channeled through the Messiah becomes a mission to Israel. Remember, he'll raise up an Israelite ruler to bless 
his people and the world. But all we need to do is go back to the same last paragraph of 2 Kings. In this story of Jehoiakim that traced the pattern of the life of Joseph and simply recall that Jehoiakim is a son of David. The last paragraph in the story of the kings of Israel combines the portraits of Joseph and Judah. And this is the great hope of God's people. This is the, the, the theology of missions for Israel. This is how the Lord will restore blessing to the nations. And remarkably, then, Genesis forms a mini Bible. It begins with creation and stretches forth to a foretaste of the messianic kingdom. It's a charter for the theology of Israel's mission, Israel's vocation in the world. So the, we have Joseph, the divine pattern of kingship, and Judah, the divine promise of kingship, lead us now to Jesus, the divine portrait of kingship. Friends, look at this twofold portrait of kingship and gaze upon the face of the Messiah. Like Joseph, the Messiah will be despised and rejected and righteously endure suffering before he's exalted by God. And like Judah, the Messiah will make an ardent central act of atonement, offering himself in place of his brothers. The Messiah came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Friends, see how these portraits intersect at the cross of our Lord's agony. The bread he gives for the life of the world is himself, his own body. Isaiah had seen this portrait, hadn't he? Isaiah proclaims the mystery of a suffering servant, a man of sorrows who was despised and rejected by men, who was stricken by God, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, by whose stripes we are healed, who was led like a lamb to the slaughter, who offered up his life as a sacrifice and poured out his soul unto death. Friends, the Prince of Glory writhed in anguish for our salvation. He took the cup of judgment, fuming and brimming over with the eternal wrath of a good and holy and just God. And he brought the brim to his own lips, staggering under the blows of divine justice, drinking down, down to its dregs. He descended into hell for us. Look at this portrait, the agonizing Messiah, and see there the eternal love of our triune God. The Father in love, sending his son like his precious little lamb, his precious beloved son. The Holy Spirit in love, empowering and leading the son like a lamb to the slaughter. And the son in love, taking on our flesh so that he could take our place in judgment and render up himself an offering unto God. Gaze at the portrait until you see the eternal plan of God, the love of God for sinners. Jesus, the friend of sinners, who turned to his father and said, I will be surety for the elect. Place every single one of them into my hand and I will not lose one. I will bring them back to you, Father. And then he laid down his life and he endured the wrath and the judgment of God completely for all of our sins, emptying out the vials of God's wrath so that we can be free and that we can have assurance that we are saved, not because God will ever wink at sin, but because the Messiah, our elder brother, took the cup and experienced the pains of hell forever within himself so that his brothers might go free. God's mission, friends, is to enable, enable guilty sinners to rejoice in the Son and to cry out, he loved me and he gave himself for me. He took my place, he took my cup, he bore my judgment. 
Therefore, Isaiah goes on, he will be highly exalted. He will be very high. That's the pattern. So friends, behold him now in his glory. Behold him in his radiant splendor. The Lord Jesus Christ has been highly exalted to the right hand of God in the heavenlies, far above all powers and principalities and authorities and kingdoms. He's been given the name above all name, the highest name. He's been exalted, friends, to save, to the uttermost, which is the whole reason uh, all day today, part of the, the, the keynote has been we need to go. He's been exalted to save to the uttermost. Or as Isaiah puts it, after he's exalted to the right hand of God, Isaiah says, the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Friends, this is the place from which mission flows. Like the waters of life cascading down from the throne of God, mission flows from the exalted Messiah who pours out the Holy Spirit. God has raised up an Israelite ruler to bless his people in the world. The Lord Jesus Christ said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. And that is our first application, go. Is the Holy Spirit calling you tonight to join God in this mission by being a herald of what God has already done in Christ? Christ has been exalted to save to the uttermost, to save his people and the world. But the Lord raises up by his spirit those who will proclaim this reality to a lost and dying world. If God is calling you, answer that call. Yes, there's hardship. We've heard about a lot of that. But what greater thing to do with your life than to proclaim the Messiah who laid down his life for us and now reigns victoriously? If God is calling you, talk to your pastor, your elder. But for others, even if you're not called to be a pastor or a missionary, you can still praise God. You can still exalt Christ. This is your calling to live out your life according to what God has already done. God has exalted his son. Friends and young people, listen to me. Exalt Christ with your whole life in your speech, in your thoughts, in your hearts, in your actions. Exalt Christ, and when he is lifted up, he will draw men unto himself. But let me also ask you tonight, have you bowed the knee to Lord Jesus? Have you repented of all of your sins and guilt? Have you beat your breast and said, have mercy on me, a sinner? Have you repented truly of your sins and trustingly turned to the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation and for your life and for your everything? Do you know anything of the bliss and the blessings of being under his reign? Have you tasted the bread of life by faith? Because here's the thing. It's your cup. It's your cup. You're the one who has broken the law of God. You're the one who has failed to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. You're the one who has failed even to render thanksgiving to God for the gift of life. It's your cup. And as we heard today, 
It's your judgment. Hell is eternal. To live eternally under the wrath of God, the one whose name is mercy. You're the one who must fear death. It has been appointed a man to die and then to face God in judgment. But friends, I have just proclaimed to you the Son of God who took on flesh precisely to take that cup for you. What can possibly be holding you back from knowing the love of God? Repent and turn to Jesus Christ. Give him your life. And know the embrace of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and the love of the multitude of his people. My friends, if you don't know the Lord and you know you don't know the Lord, the time is now. It's not tomorrow. It's right now in your heart. Confess, repent of your sins, place yourself in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, I can't close without one more application, without pleading with you, friends, to please pray the promises of God for the Jewish people who are be loved of God for the sake of the patriarchs whose gifts and calling are irrevocable and who will be shown mercy, Romans 11. And make no mistake, this is precisely the application this text is calling for. You see, if the story of Joseph gives us a paradigm for how God will restore blessing to the nations, then suddenly the details matter a great deal. Observe this. The Israelite brothers first reject God's choice of ruler. They despise their own brother and sell him into death, saying, will you indeed reign over us? Will you indeed have dominion over us? And listen, when he's exalted as ruler, they don't recognize him. They think he's a Gentile. And it's the same case so often in our own day. When Jesus reveals himself, and that's what he needs to do to his Israelite brethren, do you think he will be any less gracious than Joseph to his brothers? Joseph, who said, yes, you planned evil against me, but God intended it for good in order to bring about this day to save many people alive. Do not fear, he says. I myself will care for you and your little ones. And when he reveals himself to his brothers, they are full of dread and terror. They know what they've done. And Joseph says, no, this is what God has done. And then later their father Jacob dies and they think, oh, now that our father is dead, now he's going to exact retribution. And they fear again for their lives and for their families. And Joseph once more opens arms to them. Friends, imagine Imagine for a moment these words coming from the lips of Jesus to his Jewish brethren. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me. Look, it was to preserve life that God sent me before you. It was God who sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth. God did it, he says, for a third time. Why did God do it? To save your lives by a great deliverance. May that deliverance come soon. Let's pray. Our blessed and holy God, we pray that you would seal this word to our hearts, that by your spirit we would exalt Christ in our hearts, and that you would grant us a greater and greater vision of him in all of his glory. Lord, we know that that is the answer and the remedy to all of our problems, even the problem of a failure to go forth admission to the world. And so grant us this grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would turn in your booklets.
to Jesus Shall Reign. It's uh, listed as 417. It's a rendition of Psalm 72. And let's stand and sing our praises. Our next session begins tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. We look forward to seeing you there, and the Lord bless you this evening.